So I'll just uh, start with um, a reminder to all who are attending that this meeting is being recorded. Um, I'll just uh, confirm that we have a quorum. Commissioner Cameron, good morning. Uh, good morning, I'm here. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. I'm here. Good morning, Commissioner Zuniga. Good morning, everyone here. Great, thank you. Um, as, as we've stated at the beginning of um, all of our public meetings, we are able to do this during this period uh, remotely because of relief granted by Governor Baker in an executive order to public bodies like ours. And we've been using the remote technology since uh, March 14th. And again, thanks to um, our, IE, our, our IT team um, that turn things over so smoothly and we'll be hearing from Katrina a little bit later today. We'll get started. Um, today is January 28th. Where did January go? Um, and it is about just 1001 public meeting number 334. And we're going to start with the approval of the minutes. This with uh, Commissioner O'Brien for September 30th, please. Uh, certainly. Uh, Madam Chair, I would move that the commission approve the minutes in the packet from September 30th, 2020, subject to any necessary corrections for typographical or non-material matters. Second. Right. So everybody's had a chance to review them. Any suggested edits? You're all set, Enrique. Excellent. Then uh, vote, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. And I vote yes for zero. Thank you. And I am sorry. I think maybe perhaps Vivian is recording minutes. I see Vivian there. Everyone, good morning, Vivian. We haven't seen you for a bit. It's nice to see you and thank you for helping today. Commissioners, it's nice to see Vivian, right? That's excellent. She looks great. You do, you do. We miss you. All righty, and moving on then, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, yes, there's another set of packets, uh, minutes in the packet, October 1st, 2020. I would move that the commission approve uh, the minutes of October 1st, 2020, subject to any typographical or non-material corrections as necessary. Second. Great. Does anybody have any edits or suggestions? Or I have a real simple one, and it, this may have occurred in other minutes and I didn't pick it up on, I think it's on page three or four. Um, Commissioner O'Brien, just at 11.38, it says that the chair suggested that we go into executive session. And I think, you know, that sounds a little casual. Um, that is, is, of course, how we don't go into executive session. It's very highly regulated by the open meeting law. So perhaps on, on that, we might say something like the chair next stated that the commission anticipated. Uh, going into executive session. And then, of course, we're required to vote on that. And usually, um, our general counsel will, will um, come to, the, to me to say there might be a need for an executive session, and we discuss it, and then Karen helps to, um, to, to relay that message so that all of us are prepped for it. But we do make that decision in, uh, according to the, the law um, during this during our public session, and then we move into the executive session. So thank you. So with that edit, any other edits? Alrighty, thanks. I'll take a, a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes, yeah, so four zero. Thank you, Karen. And then we'll go, before Karen, though, we go into the administrative update, um, I just have to fix my view here because I can see everybody there. Now I can see everyone a little bit better. And I can see Karen Wells better. Good morning. Want, we have a little moment to have some fun and to celebrate some news. Karen Wells, our executive director, highlighted in this month's issue of Global Gaming Business Magazine. We know it as GB, GGB Magazine as one of the top 25 people to watch in 2021. And it is with great pleasure that we um, 
we join in and we get to watch you on an everyday basis, but it's really wonderful to know actually internationally that you are um, being recognized for your leadership here in Massachusetts. Um, you know, this is the beginning of your first full year of being executive director. You've been executive director for years in the interim um, process. <laughs> it feels like years. But now, yeah, you know, cumulative, you know, really it's been over years as interim. And now this is your launching of your first, of your first full year in the full position. And we can't really think of a better way for you to be celebrated. So congratulations, it's exciting and truly deserving. And I should note that um, Phil Hornbuckle, CEO and uh, president of MGM Resorts International is in Karen's good company. So um, congratulations to him as well. Commissioners. Oh yeah, yeah. I know how much I know how much uh, Director Wells loves this. Coming from her public <laughs> safety background, I know that you always dread when you're um, when you're in some way in the spotlight because you never know if it's going to be good or bad. But this is well deserved and enjoy it, Karen. Don't be don't dread it. Enjoy it, and it's it is really well deserved. Thank you. Enrique, Eileen? Yeah, same here. It's, um, it's well deserved. I, I would argue that um, uh, she was a person to watch much, much earlier than, <laughs> uh, than uh, today or this, this month uh, and from all the trajectory that you allude to, uh, Chair, not just as, uh, as an executive director for the better part of more than a year, I think. Yes. It started as interim, but uh, in a prior role as an interim executive director and in her very um, well uh, uh, performance, uh, great performance as a, um, a director of the IEB uh, for the better part of the life of this uh, commission. Um, I will just mention that there is um, a very interesting coincidence, if you will, that uh, we'll be evaluating Karen uh, in the next meeting. <laughs> uh, and Karen, I didn't be, go there. He this did that. Will be, uh, yeah. This will be one of the aspects of um, the accomplishments, uh, and I just say that um, jokingly, of course. But uh, congratulations, Karen. Thank you. Yes, well, duly note this, um, Eileen. Uh, no, uh, congratulations, Karen. I do, yeah, point out that, of course, I found out about this not from Karen herself, but from uh, Ryan Connors, because true to form, Karen's not going to boast about it. But um, <laughs> I agree with the. It's, it's overdue. I mean, I've known Karen for a long time. I'm not at all surprised that if she steps into this other role, people are taking notice of it. So there's a reason we put her at the helm for in a permanent role. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very much, Eileen. I appreciate it. Thank you all. So that's a fun way to start um, a, a pretty uh, rigorous agenda. So we'll continue on, Karen, um, for your administrative update. And again, congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, so for item 3A, uh, the administrative update, we are continuing with our um, update for the commissioners and the public on what's going on on site at the casinos given the COVID pandemic and the enhanced security and safety protocols that the commission has implemented uh, to make sure that people are safe at the casinos and uh, while they're still operating, they can do so successfully and safely. So I'm going to turn that over to our uh, director of the IEB uh, deputy, uh, and uh, Deputy Director Bruce Band um, to give you an update on what's going on there. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Loretta first. Hi, thanks, Karen. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, so last Thursday, January 21st, the governor issued COVID-19 Order 62, which went into effect at 5 a.m. on Monday of this week. And for us, the order means repeal of the mandatory nightly 9.30 p.m. closing time of the three casino properties and their amenities that had been in effect. The order keeps in place the 25% capacity limits at each of the three properties until at least 5 a.m. on February 8th. Uh, all other COVID-19 related health and safety measures remain in place, uh, in including, for example, the mask requirements, no food on the gaming floor, beverages only while seated in gaming, the distancing measures, the use of the plexiglass as um, previously approved by the commission. Uh, the heightened cleaning and sanitization protocols. Uh, and so now all three properties are authorized to return to 24 seven operations and they've been working hard to get their plans in place to do so. It has meant the ability for them to call some folks back from uh, furlough 
uh, with some retraining uh, involved as well. So the Bruce Band and his team have been working with the, each property to ensure that all of the areas are uh, appropriately staffed as the hours are increased. Um, Bruce and Burt Kane and uh, Louis Lozano at Encore, Angela Smith at uh, MGM, and Andrew Stephan at uh, PPC and their teams have been, you know, continuing to show great adaptability uh, in all of this. So I would like to ask Bruce to uh, jump in and report to you on each of the properties uh, in turn and the, the details that, uh, that he has been reviewing. So Bruce, if sure. you mind jumping. Yeah. Good morning, Bruce. Good morning, all. Uh, first, I'd like to tell you that uh, as far as the 25%, MGM had a high of 18% since the last time I spoke to you. Encore had a high of 17%, and PPC a high of 18.5%, well below the 25% rule. Uh, PPC went 24 hours last, uh, yesterday. They started with that. They are uh, going to be operating continuously uh, as of yesterday. Uh, they're operating uh, uh, a few restaurants, all their food court, slacks, and uh, the racing operations as well. Uh, they, they brought back a few people to fill some of the vacancies that they had. Uh, that everything seems to be go, going pretty smoothly with their operations so far. Encore starts, uh, started their uh, 24 operations yesterday as well. Uh, they actually brought uh, 500 people back from furlough. Uh, they're gonna be operating eight restaurants, which include like Rare, Red 8, uh, Mystique, and uh, so on. They'll be reopening their salon uh, and uh, opening up the spa as well on weekends. Uh, Encore has also uh, done uh, taken an additional step in their uh, uh, service bars where they've added plexiglass splits between for added protection for the cocktail services servers the uh, uh, service dispensers were a little close so they added this added precaution for protection uh, for their employees in there MGM uh, they start their 24 operations on uh, uh, Friday. Uh, they're uh, remaining to keep open the South End uh, food market there. They're not opening any additional restaurants at this time, uh, but they said that they uh, will as they uh, go further along. Does anybody have any uh, questions about that at, at this point or venture? Very thorough, Bruce. Any questions, commissioners? Come yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious. Um, but it's perhaps too early to tell, uh, uh, Bruce, but do you anticipate um, perhaps more visitation uh, as a result of the 24 hour operation, or maybe perhaps some of the same total number I, of people spread throughout? I think definitely because oh, prime hours in this industry are really nine to to midnight, somewhere in there, and with closing it by 9.30, I think it, it's probably prevented a lot of people from visiting the casino. So uh, I would expect to see, especially starting this weekend, I think you'll see the numbers up quite a bit. Great. Commissioner O'Brien, do you have any questions for Bruce? Or Loretta? I don't, no, thank you. There are, um, just a I little. did have a chair. I did have want to address uh, the simulcasting side at Suffolk okay. Downs and Raynham as well. Of course, Dr. Lautbound has been in touch with uh, uh, both of those operators, and uh, they are aware of the updated order. And they have submitted their, their hours to us. It's some extension of hours, uh, not a 24/7 situation. Suffolk Downs is uh, operating five days a week, closing at six on Wednesday, Thursdays and Sundays, and seven on Fridays and Saturdays. And Raynham is uh, operating six days a week, closed on Tuesdays, open until five on Mondays, 9.30 on Wednesdays and Thursdays, 
open till 11 on Fridays and Saturdays and closing at eight on Sundays. So they are up to date on the latest orders and you know, remain um, aware of all of the compliance measures. Questions, Commissioner Cameron? All set? Okay. All set, no questions. Thank you, good report. Thank you. One just quick edit uh, because in the event that uh, someone reviews the agenda in the future. Um, <clears throat> under 3A, we'd want to uh, strike the word interim for Loretta's title. Uh, Very observant, I have to say. I was, um, I hadn't <laughs> noticed. So thank you for, for having my back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry because that was my job before it got posted, and so I was observant a little late in the in the game. So, <laughs> Thank you. Um, but we just want to make sure the record is clear that you are in fact director. Thank you. So thank you, and thank you for the thorough report. Consistent, right, commissioners, with um, what we've expected, and I know this is very um, welcome relief for our licensees. So, the also the the um, news today. I, I just saw. Perhaps you all saw an article in the. New York Times that's suggesting that there's just a very steep decline in cases and doesn't mean we can in any way um, be anything short of vigilant, but let's just hope that this is this is trending in the, in the right direction uh, for our licensees and for all of us, right? So thanks. And, and Bruce, thank you for your thorough report. We'll move on then to uh, some other compliance news. Karen, do you want to introduce um, Katrina and team, please? Yes, so I am going to turn it over to our uh, CIO of our Information Technology Services Division, Katrina Jagger Gomes, who is going to introduce her team. Uh, and they're going to do a presentation on the uh, gaming technical compliance side of the house and some of the things that they're working on right now. So I'll turn it over to Katrina. Good morning, morning. Katrina. Good morning. Thank you, Executive Director Wells. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. So as part of the department overview series that we started last year, uh, I can't believe it's been, we're, as you said earlier, Chair, we're already in January. Where has the time gone? Uh, the Information Technology Services Division presented in February of last year a high-level overview of the ITS division and its team. So today we are truly excited to share a more in-depth look at the inner workings of one of our specific units within the ITS division, Gaming Technical Compliance. So presenting today will be Scott Helwig, our Gaming Technical Compliance Manager, and Priya Gandotra, our Gaming Technical Compliance Engineer. Scott? Thank you, Katrina. Hello, Chair and fellow Commissioners. Nice to see you, Scott. Nice to see you as well. I know we don't get to see each other as much because we're I know. so it's, it's very I nice to be able to show everybody my my face. So um, we, we miss you. We <laughs> miss you. <laughs> well, thank you. The the um, the feelings mutual. So yeah, it's it's uh, good to see all the colleagues here today. Um, so today we will be presenting an, an overview of the gaming technical compliance division. We will begin by highlighting a few of our regulations which outline the MGC gaming technical standards to be followed by our licensees. We, the Gaming Technical Compliance Team, or GTC team, may not need to know all subparagraphs within each regulation listed, although a general understanding will help us better serve our MGC colleagues. The GTC also assists in the creation and revisioning of gaming technical regulations as necessary. As we did with our regulations, we will again highlight some of the gaming standards MGC has adopted from Gaming Laboratories International, better known as GLI. GLI is a certified independent testing lab, and we will discuss them a little later. But for this moment, we would like to mention these standards are used by a majority of gaming regulators across the US when a new version of the standard is released, the GTC will assist with the revisioning and re of our regulations as necessary. The GTC operates the MGC Gaming Technical Compliance Lab located in the Boston office. We use the lab to complete additional testing for electronic gaming devices, better known as EGDs, and EGD systems as deemed necessary. 
We also assist with other MGC initiative testing, for example, the Play My Way application currently in use at Plainridge Park Casino. We review the reports sent from our certified independent testing labs on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis, and we'll send notifications regarding revocated software or decommissioned software to our licensees as necessary. Currently, the MGC has approved GLI and BMM test labs for EGD software testing. The GTC also reserves the right through regulation to audit our certified independent testing labs on a yearly basis. Another task completed by the GTC is to work alongside our Network Operations Center team, or NOC team, and we will speak more about this in a few minutes. Right now, we would like to speak about the partnerships we have with some of our MGC colleagues. For instance, we provide monthly reports to our Investigation and Enforcement Bureau agents along with EGD manufacturer specific documentation as well as other requests for information as needed. At times, the finance team will request assistance with meter investigations or the review of technical requirements for an accounting report. As mentioned earlier, we also assist the research and responsible gaming team with programs that contain technical components like Play My Way. Lastly, and this year especially, we were able to provide COVID specific reports to assist with social distancing measures in place at our licensees. As mentioned earlier, the MGC has a dedicated NOC team which maintains and operates the Massachusetts Gaming Commission Central Monitoring System better known as the MGC CMS. The GTC meets with the NOC on a daily basis to ensure technical compliance through the use of features available from the MGC CMS. We would like to expand on these features of the MGC CMS. With 24 seven communication monitoring, it allows for automated and on-demand software validations. It also collects accounting data that is available for review in real time and can be presented in many ways using the built-in reporting feature. Lastly, we assist with the configuration of the security features available from the MGC CMS. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to our gaming technical compliance engineer, Priya Gandacha. Priya? Thank you, Scott. Uh, last, the last tool we would like to speak about today is our data warehouse. This allows the GTC and the finance team the ability to review data without affecting the performance of MGC CMS. The data warehouse is updated daily to ensure accurate reports can be generated uh, for immediate use. <laughs> that's that's our, our other um, member of the team, Lucy Gandatra, that you just heard there. So she was, she was letting everybody know that thank you for your time, and, and if you have any questions or comments, we would greatly appreciate that. I have a quick question for Priya. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yes. <laughs> there, um, I'm trying to understand the last slide where you have a picture of containers. Uh, so that refers to uh, the data architecture. Normally, when when you get data in, you have to put them in containers, I see. Uh, which are also known as tables or uh, database. Um, basically, yeah, it's just a database. No, I, I I thought it was something like that, but I wanted I wanted you to explain. It's it was a it was a it was a cute slide. <laughs> Thanks. So Madam, Madam Chair, I did I did have a, a comment, you know, just, you know, going through this. First of all, I'm very impressed. So congratulations to Katrina and her team, just all the work that they do. Um, it's, it's just an incredible accomplishment, all that they've done over the last several years. The Massachusetts Gaming Commission is a new agency, and they are really at the forefront of a lot of technical things. Uh, very impressive. I, I remember when we were starting out and uh, teams went to visit some other gaming jurisdictions just to get information, figure out how we were going to set up this organization. And I remember being in New Jersey and being educated on just how critical 
um, the IT, the gaming technical compliance, like how important that is to our regulatory mission. Um, so seeing this and seeing how far we've come in these accomplishments, is, it's really impressive. So congratulations to Katrina and her whole team. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Really impressive presentation. Um, uh, it is amazing how many things we do, uh, and it's a nice reminder. And I know that we're always keeping up with best practices. So um, congratulations as well to the whole team. And uh, Katrina, congratulations on your appointment to the Commission on um, Women and Girls in Essex County. That is impressive and really important work. Thank you. Yes, and likewise, uh, likewise, congratulations. I, I actually had a small, um, a small question for Scott. No, yes, please. Um, um, Scott, you mentioned that, that we have the, the, the two largest uh, independent test labs uh, are authorized to conduct um, the testing um, uh, as per our regulations, uh, BMM and GLI. I know GLI is, uh, has a, a big share of the market. Uh, in, in you know in, in the industry and that the, the decision to get tested is mostly by the manufacturer but um, can you expound a little bit as to you know whether um, you know that split is um, how, how much testing is BMM doing um, what kind of testing um, I'm just thinking in terms of um, having the availability of both being good for you know for the industry and for us Right, yeah, it, it does give our manufacturers a, a, a choice of, of where they want to go with their testing. Um, I, I don't really know the numbers off the top of my head of, of, of you know, the, the bulk. Of, uh, let me, I guess a better way to put it is Eli is getting the bulk of the request for, for testing. BMM does receive some. Um, it's not that they're not getting any. So, and when they test, they will actually use our regulations, which, as you know, have, adopted the GLI standards as well, and they'll go through the same rigorous testing that GLI does. So, does that answer your question? Yes, thank okay. you. Great, great. So to add to Scott's answer on that, we, in our jurisdiction, we have about 90% that's done by GLI and only 10% by BMM. Well, there you go. <laughs> thank you, Katrina. So, Brian? Any questions for Scott or Priya or Katrina? No, no, I don't. Thank you. It's very succinct um, and um, something I can wrap my head around, which is you know, something to be said for explaining IT to someone like me. Um, and then, and congratulations, uh, Katrina. Also, that's great. Yeah, thank you, Scott, for making that really accessible. I just, I may not, I may not have appreciated this, but I think that you noted that we were able to use technology in, to help on the uh, issues around social distancing. Did I hear that correctly? Could you just yeah. explain that a little bit to me? I don't think I appreciated that. Sure. Um, so when we were starting to open up the casinos again, when um, you know, during the pandemic, I think it was about July or so, um, we had worked with our IEB division to create a report which um, what we did in the, the MGC CMS is we used a feature that we can basically put a marker on a machine, if you want it for lack of a better term. And then we, we know if, if that machine is either active for service or out of service on the casino floor. And then we can actually, we were actually able to help the casino see if these games were being disabled properly. Um, and that was the report that, that we were using in the beginning there uh, and, and stuff. So yeah. And, and we continue to, to look at it and, and let the casinos know, like, hey, we noticed this game that's supposed to be out of service has some play mm -hmm. on it. And then maybe they were they were just testing it because they changed the software or something, put it back out of service, or they had moved it somewhere where they could put it in service. And then we have our knock team adjust those those markers so that it doesn't come up in our, in our reports. And in addition to that, we did work with the properties when they reopened on the, when the restriction on the times yeah. was um, um, invoked to be 930. We worked in concert through Bruce and his team along with the properties to automatically disable all the EGDs on the floor to assist the properties to be in compliance with vacating the premises of all patrons. And that was a feature that that our licensees didn't even fully appreciate that we provide had that capacity and it it really 
it was um, an assistance uh, back in July for the reopening, correct? Yes. Yep. And now, and now again, this. So, mm -hmm. the, um, I I like uh, not only the report on the excellent testing and the compliance, but just really how our IT team works as a partner for the licensees to ensure their compliance and to be helpful and not just a tester of them. <laughs> um, and 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 that that's a critical function and really Karen um, reflects you know how this MGC team works with its licensees. So thank you. Uh, and it was really helpful to think about the uh, social distancing. I don't think I fully appreciate that. So thanks so much. Any well, other questions? Thanks, Scott. It's so great to see you. And and Priya, I'm I I don't know if I completely heard Scott, but I'm thinking that that was a small voice in the background from your home. <laughs> yes, you might make an appearance here. Come <laughs> say hi. Yay! Oh. Hi. <laughs> An official, official welcoming. There she is. Congratulations again. That's wonderful. Thank you. Lucy is a future coder and developer in the working. <laughs> <laughs> Osmosis alone, correct? Um, there, there we go. Thanks, thanks, Katrina. Karen, are you all set? Yeah, I'm all set. Item three, so we can move on to item four, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Now we're going on to research and responsible gaming and director Mark Vanderlinden. Good morning, Mark. And Teresa, good morning. Good morning. Commissioners. Um, I'm joined with Teresa Fiore, our program manager for research responsible gaming, Marlene Warner um, with the Mass Council on Gaming and Health. And okay, there we go. We have uh, Dr. Richard Wood and uh, Nassim um, Tabri from Carleton University in um, Gamrez uh, to talk about an important initiative. Um, uh, as we continue to advance the GameSense program, um, and just in general, the, the uh, responsible gaming initiatives in Massachusetts. I'm going to actually turn it over to uh, Teresa to do a little bit more of an introduction and, and tee this up for you. So, Teresa, do you want to take it over? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Teresa. Hi. Um, so in 2019, we, when I say we, I mean Mark and myself, um, along with the Mass Council on Gaming and Health, critically examined the GameSense program and launched a new, new initiatives as part of GameSense 2.0 to ensure that the program remains relevant and that we are evolving with the players in Massachusetts. Um, one such initiative that was identified was the positive play scale. So up until this point, as some of you may remember, the majority of studies examining player behavior have primarily focused on problem behaviors. Um, the positive play scale um, takes a different approach by measuring responsible gambling behaviors, or in other words, play that does not suggest a movement towards at-risk or problem um, behavior categories. So for this study, um, I would also like to thank the GameSense advisors who are instrumental in gathering data to inform the final survey design. Um, so, you know, introducing the positive play scale a bit further, the initiative examines the full spectrum of players' responsible gaming beliefs and behaviors, um, including personal responsibility, gambling literacy, honesty and control, and pre-commitment. And based on the exploration of these four areas, the team delivered actionable recommendations that will be used to drive responsible gaming communications, campaigns, and outreach initiatives. Um, as more jurisdictions throughout the US and Canada carry, carry out similar studies, we're pleased to contribute our findings to this growing body of evidence. Um, and we'll advance the field as a whole and allow us to benefit from these shared insights. Leading this particular initiative and here with us today, um, as Mark mentioned, is Dr. Richard Wood of Carleton University. Dr. Wood is a psychologist specializing in the study of gambling behavior and a member of GAMRES, a Canadian consultancy which designs, implements, and evaluates responsible gaming strategy. Also joining us is Dr. Nassim Tabri, who along with Dr. Wood was part of the team responsible for developing the positive play scale. 
So with that, I'm going to turn the spotlight over to them so that they may share their findings of this important initiative. Um, so Dr. Wood, I don't know if you would like to share your screen in the report. Otherwise, I'm sure. happy to do so. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And um, good morning, commissioners and everybody. And thank you very much for inviting me here today to talk to you a little bit about the study that we conducted with the positive play scale. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you can all see that. There we go. Okay, so um, yeah, so the positive uh, play study that we conducted in Massachusetts was really about understanding how responsible players are in Massachusetts and discovering which areas that they uh, do well in and which areas they could perhaps be supported further in. Uh, and this information should then be useful, particularly for game sense advisors, to give them a little bit more insight and focus moving forwards. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what the positive play scale is and, and what it does, and then what that tells us about positive play in, uh, in Massachusetts. So as a bit of background to the, the positive play scale, really it's about evaluating responsible gambling strategies so that we have a better understanding of how they work. And there are really three key questions that we need to ask about a responsible gambling strategy in order to understand it. The first is, how do we know that it works? Uh, assuming that some of it works, um, how do we know that? Uh, and the second part is which parts of it work best because it's likely that some elements are doing relatively well and, and some elements could do with a little bit more support. And then finally, what works best for different players? Now, I think typically in the field, there's been a kind of one size fits all approach, but I think we're starting to learn now that, that segmentation um, can help us to support um, players in it differently, in different players in better ways. And so the way that these questions were typically answered in the past uh, was by focusing on, on these players. And these are the, the players that, that have gambling problems. Now, the problem with focusing on these players to understand responsible gambling is that we're looking at a very small number of players here. It's, you know, in the, in the population, it tends to be sort of one, two, possibly 3%. And so, and these players um, often will have a gambling problem for, for a long period of time. And so it's difficult to see how a responsible gambling strategy can, can uh, assist those players, except perhaps in terms of you know, referring them on to treatment services. Uh, and because the numbers of these players are very small, um, it's very difficult to, to perform an analysis and to look at sort of um, different types of players within that group. Often these uh, players don't want to take part in research, you know, particularly if it's over the phone and they have to talk in front of their, their family and friends. Um, and also focusing on people with gambling problems is quite a reactive response. It's not very proactive. We're looking at people where, where things have already gone wrong. And I guess most importantly for us in this project, it, it doesn't tell us very much about the vast majority of players and how well they're doing. And so the reason that we developed the, the positive play scale was to look at all of the players, um, the vast majority of which, of course, never have any problems, and a few of them will have sort of more minor problems. And so these players we called the, the positive players. And one of the real advantages of looking at these players is that now we're looking at the sort of the 98 and 99 percent of players. And so we, can see, we have a lot more data and we can see much more sort of nuanced differences. We can look at different player segments and look at the different needs that different players have uh, and so on. And so that's really the, the reason that we developed the, the positive play scale. Now, <clears throat> the positive play scale itself, so this, it was developed by myself, um, Dr. Nassim Tabri, Dr. Wall and uh, Michael Wall and Dr. Uh, Khalil Philander. And, um, 
it was the first ever scale to provide an objective and standardized measure of responsible gambling. So before, other than looking at problem gambling, there wasn't really a, an objective way to measure what responsible gambling is. Uh, and as I just noted, it provides insight into the whole player base and not just those with gambling problems. Uh, and because it's standardized and objective, it means that we can um, develop benchmarks for responsible gambling. So, you know, we can see how well a particular jurisdiction is doing it at one point in time. And then we can see whether uh, that improves over time or, or whether it gets worse. Uh, and it also means that we can start to measure uh, the impact of changes to the gambling climate. So, for example, if a new casino was to open, you could use the positive play scale with players before the casino opened and then after the casino opened and see if it impacts their overall levels of, of positive or responsible play. Or if, um, if a new, new responsible gambling initiative is introduced, you could do the same thing. So it's a way to measure change over time. And so in doing this, we can then start to optimize the responsible gambling strategy by finding out what works well uh, and what doesn't work. And so we can find out where better to employ resources more effectively. And then finally, it allows us to segment the strategy, move away from this kind of one size fits all approach to look at different players and the different needs that those players might have. So that the positive play scale itself then is, is actually composed of four subscales or four elements. Uh, so there are two belief elements. The first one focuses on personal responsibility. And this is the extent to which the individual player uh, believes that it's their responsibility to only play within the means, only play with what they can afford. The second belief element looks at gambling literacy. So this is their understanding of the nature of gambling, um, whether they understand randomness, um, it, whether they have any misperceptions about the games that they play and so on. And then there are two uh, behavior elements. So there's honesty and control, and this is the extent to which players are uh, feeling control of their gambling behavior and are honest with themselves and others about the, the games that they play. And then finally, pre-commitment. And this is refers to the extent to which players consider how much time and money they want to uh, and can afford to spend on a game before they start playing. So it can include using things like uh, limit setting tools, but really it's more about the sort of the thinking about what they can afford to spend before they actually start playing. And then depending on how players score um, on the positive play scale, how they answer the 14 items that represent that um, represent those attitudinal and behavior elements, players can then be placed into one of three categories. So this then tells us what percentage of players in Massachusetts um, are scoring high, so they're clearly a positive player with no issues, the scoring medium, so they're mostly a positive player, but there are some areas where they could improve upon, or whether they're scoring low, so they're not generally a positive player, but they may have some um, positive play tendencies. So by looking at the percentage of players that fall into each of those categories, we get a snapshot of how responsible players are in, in Massachusetts. Right, so that's a bit of background. I'm now going to talk about the actual study and, and the findings from it. So the study was conducted last, uh, between, um, September and October last year it was a sample of 1,512 uh, Massachusetts players. Uh, it was a convenient sample that was recruited by a third-party survey company. 100% uh, of the sample had played at least one game in the last 12 months because we're really interested in looking at people that play because those are the people that are more exposed to uh, responsible gambling initiatives are more likely to met with game sense advisors uh, and 50 percent had gambled at a, a massachusetts casino in the last 12 months uh, and there was an equal number of males and females 
and the sample was represented by age groups. It was an online survey that they conducted and it contained the, the 14 item positive play scale as well as the, the um, problem gambling severity index, the PGSI, to measure levels of problem gambling. And then there were general demographic questions. Um, and we also asked about the frequency of gambling before and during after the, the time when the casinos were closed in Massachusetts. And we also asked about various attitudes towards responsible gambling uh, and, and responsible gambling initiatives in general. And so the overall purpose was to identify the overall level of positive play, so how responsible are Massachusetts players, and to identify specific areas that could be further developed in the future and find out who, you know, which, which player segments are most and least responsible. And then another element was to, to try and develop a better understanding of, of how players play during a, a pandemic and how they might be better supported in the future. Right, so now I'm gonna present some of the data to you. And there's quite a lot of charts, but really I'm just gonna show you the kind of um, the patterns and, and, and what that says about uh, positive play in Massachusetts. And so across the bottom here, we have the, the belief subscales and the behavior subscales. And so if we look at the first one, which was personal responsibility. Now, the, what the, how this works is the, the green part of the bar represents those that are scoring high. The uh, orange, uh, yellowy orangey bar represents the medium scorers and the sort of dark orange represents the low scorers. So really, the, the greater the, the green bar, the more responsible they are overall. And so you can see straight away with personal responsibility that the vast majority of players were scoring high. And, and in general, this is what we expect from most of the, uh, from most, that most players will score high because most players are, are fairly responsible and don't have any issues. However, when we then turn to gambling literacy, their understanding of the, of the games that they play, we can see it's actually quite a bit lower. So now it's just over a third that are scoring um, high. And so that's an area where players could perhaps receive a little bit more support in helping them to understand the nature of gambling and the games that they play. Uh, then if we look at honesty and control, again, it's, it's fairly high. The majority is scoring high there. And, and pre-commitment, a little lower, but just over half are scoring high. So straight away, we can see that gambling literacy and, and uh, pre-commitments are certainly areas that would benefit from a little bit more uh, focus going forward. So how does this compare to other jurisdictions? So we've conducted the, the positive play scale in, in a number of uh, areas now, including all across Canada uh, and with four other states. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a, um, a comparison here. And so we, again, we have the four subscales across the bottom. And now we have um, Massachusetts, four other states where we conducted research, uh, and Canada. And so for personal responsibility, uh, there's the Massachusetts scores. Um, but for, for the other four states, you can see it's actually very similar in terms of personal responsibility. Um, and Canada is scoring quite a bit higher there. Uh, if we then turn to gambling literacy, it's a little bit lower for Massachusetts. Um, but again, quite similar to the four other states. Uh, and Canada's scoring higher, but lower than it did for personal responsibility. And then for honesty and control, it's a very similar pattern. So very similar to the other states. Canada's scoring a bit higher. And then finally, pre-commitment. A similar profile again. So I suppose the question here is, why did Canada score quite a bit higher? And, and I think really, when, when I think about uh, Canada in terms of responsible gaming, I, I would say that Canada and, and sort of Scandinavia are really kind of um, the leaders in terms of responsible gambling. They put a lot of resources into responsible gambling initiatives. All of the, the uh, gaming is, is provincially um, regulated. Um, and there's a lot of sharing of best practice. And, and so although this is correlational data, I think there's some suggestion here that 
the, the amount of resources has an impact upon levels of, of uh, positive play overall. Okay, so back to the, the Massachusetts data. We uh, then looked at scores by gender. So uh, in terms of personal responsibility, um, high scorers, it was 72.3% of males, uh, and females scored slightly higher at 81.4%. So they were slightly more responsible there. In terms of gambling literacy, it was kind of the other way around. So males scored slightly higher and females scored slightly lower. In terms of honesty and control, um, females scored higher than males again. And in terms of pre-commitment, uh, females were scoring higher than, than males. So overall, um, women were a little more responsible than men, except in relation to gambling literacy. Although I, I should say that the differences here were, were, were fairly small and not that meaningful. Okay, now let's look at some um, positive play scores by age. So again, we have the four, the four elements of positive play across the bottom, and now we have the age groups as well. And so if we look at personal responsibility, and what we see is as players get older, they get more responsible in terms of personal responsibility, they're scoring higher. Let's look at gambling literacy. Now, when we look at the 21 to 24 um, age group here, you can see that it's actually less than a quarter of scoring high in gambling literacy. Uh, and the same pattern occurs. So as they get older, that increases. So when we get to 65 plus, it's, it's almost um, two thirds of the scoring high in terms of gambling literacy. And we see very much the same pattern for honesty and control and also pre-commitment. So, and this is a, a finding that we've seen in jurisdictions around the world. So it seems very clear that um, younger players are uh, less responsible and over time they're becoming more responsible. Now, we don't entirely know why that might be the case, but we can speculate that um, as players uh, gamble over time, they get more experience, they learn more about the games, they're more exposed to responsible gambling initiatives. And, and of course, um, being young is more a time for, in general, for risk taking. But I think it, it shows us that having a focus on younger players and, and using um, media that um, would appeal to those players could be a, a, a useful way to, to focus responsible gambling strategy going forward. Um, okay, so now we looked at positive play by PGSI categories. So how does positive play relate to problem gambling? So again, we've got the four um, positive play elements across the bottom, but now we have different levels of uh, gambling risk. So we've got, uh, first of all, no problems, um, and then low risk, uh, moderate risk, and problem gambling. And so as you might expect, as, as their, their gambling problems become more severe, their scores on the positive play scale go down. And if we look at gambling literacy, it's even more pronounced. So in fact, for, for problem gamblers on gambling literacy, only 3.7% are, are scoring high. And very much the same profile for the other um, subscales. So it's, it's perhaps not surprising, but what I, I would say is that although there's a, um, a correlation between positive play and, and problem gambling, it's, it's, a, it's not a perfect correlation, otherwise it would be measuring the same thing. And what we tend to find is that um, people that score high on the positive play scale, people who are responsible, tend to score um, low in terms of problem gambling because you, you can't really be a responsible player and have gambling problems. But the opposite is not necessarily true. So somebody that scores low on the positive play scale will not necessarily score high um, on the PGSI. And, and this may be due to the fact that you know, they may have gambling misperceptions, they may not pre-commit, but perhaps they just don't gamble very often. If, they, if you only gamble once or twice a year, it'd be difficult for you to be, uh, for you to have a gambling problem. Or maybe they've just started gambling and they're on a trajectory towards problem gambling, but there just hasn't been enough time. So there's a correlation, but it, it's, they're measuring very different things. 
Okay, so the next thing we looked at was the types of games that players played and how that related to their positive play scores. Now, there's a little bit of a, an issue here because um, when you try to judge uh, the types of games that people play, what we find is that frequently people play lots of different types of games. So somebody might play the lotto and they may also play bingo and you know, maybe they play uh, poker as well. And so teasing out which games are having an impact can be problematic. And so to, um, to um, deal with this issue, we conducted a cluster analysis where we looked at um, whether there were patterns amongst players in terms of the types of games that they played and the frequency of um, how often they played those games. And what we found doing this analysis was that there were two clear groups of players. Uh, and the first group of players we termed the higher frequency multi-game players because they were playing at a higher frequency than the second group, which I'm, I'm going to show in a minute. And they played lots of different games. So on this, uh, on this uh, chart, if you look across the X axis going across the bottom, you can see that there are lots of different games listed. So instant tickets, lottery, and so on, uh, including some online games. And then if you look at the Y axis going up, this is the average frequency that they played these games at. Uh, and then also we have, we looked at their, um, how often they played these games before the casinos closed, which is gonna be the blue bar, um, during the casino closures, and um, when the casinos opened again, post-closure. So if we look at the first um, bar here, this is looking at instant tickets from a retailer. And so this is pre-closure. So on average, these players were playing a few times a month. And then when the casinos closed, that uh, dropped down a little bit. And then after the casinos opened again, it dropped down a little bit more. And if we look at lottery play, we see the same profile. So they're playing less as time goes on. Um, raffle tickets, the same. And it's pretty much the same across the board until we get to lottery games online. Uh, and then this goes up slightly during the casino closures, which perhaps makes sense because they perhaps wanted to stay at home and didn't want to, to, to go out during the pandemic. But then it drops down again when the casinos open. Um, Richard, could I just interrupt? I hate to sure. do that, but this is such an important um, analysis. No, please do. Just to clarify for anyone who might be listening outside and for my own good, when you speak about online model play, mm -hmm. that would be the illegal market, correct? Yeah, it's whatever they could access. Um, because in, in, in almost all of, I can't, in the United States, you must be seated in the jurisdiction of the state in mm -hmm. order to to play legally so what i just want to make sure that as we're thinking about this yeah. that the online play would have to be the and mark correct me the, you know the black market which again wouldn't necessarily have all the consumer protections mm -hmm. that would maybe inform things like the pre-commitment i just want to make sure that as we go through this that, that i'm right there isn't yes. any instance i can think of where it would be legal for the online, it's, except of horse racing, we do allow for that, but um, for mobile betting now. Yes, right? and, so, and so we covered all, all forms of online gambling. And, and of course, yes, as you say, the, the majority of these would not, not be legal in the state of, of Massachusetts. In Massachusetts right yeah. now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Unless, they, unless they're Massachusetts residents who went to another state who had online. Right. Would that yeah. would that survey capture that? So if they had a summer place in New Hampshire, which allows for online betting for sports, it, it wouldn't. But I would imagine that the numbers would be so small in comparison okay. to the overall sample size that it wouldn't really show a difference there. So I, I yeah, I think you're right. It's capturing the okay. the the illegal gambling. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. No so my apologies. No, no, that's okay. And so, yeah, so for, for lottery games online and sports betting online, it did go up slightly during the, the closure and then dropped it down again when, when the uh, casinos opened. 
And then as we go across, it's very much the same pattern all the way across. And some of these games, <laughs> they didn't play them at all during the closure. And, and so really, these all of the players in this group, the high-frequency multi-game players, they're playing lots of different games. Uh, and on average, they're playing them between um, sort of once a month and, and a few times a month. Now, the second cluster of players that we identified, these, this was a much larger group of players, and we termed these the lower frequency lottery game players. And so we have the same uh, chart here, but the difference here is that these players are primarily just playing on um, in, with instant lottery tickets and lottery draw games. Uh, and they're playing them at, at a, a lower rate. So between sort of less than once a month and about once a month. And as you can see, we also have the same um, profile here. So they were playing uh, uh, more frequently before the casino closure. Uh, and then that dropped off during the casino closure. And then when the casinos opened again, they were still playing less. Uh, but now if we look at the other games across here, they're hardly playing those at all. It's sort of between never and you know once or twice a year. And so there are big differences between these groups of players in terms of the types of games they're playing and how frequently they're playing those games. So the next thing we wanted to do was compare those two groups in terms of the, their positive play scores. So first of all, we looked at the, the low frequency lottery players and in terms of the personal responsibility, it was scoring quite high. For the high frequency multi-game players, it was significantly lower. Then we look at gambling literacy, the low frequency multi um, uh, lottery players were scoring around 45%. For the high frequency multi-game players, it was only 9.4% who were uh, scoring high in terms of gambling literacy. Uh, and honesty and control, we get pretty much the same profile, much lower for the multi-game players. And then pre-commitment, again, much lower for the multi-game players. So there are big differences in the levels of responsible or positive play between those two groups. So according to the types of games that they play and how frequently, how frequently they play those games. And then we also looked at these um, two groups of players in terms of their PGSI scores. So the blue uh, bar represents the, the, those that play primarily the lottery and the orange are the multi-game players. And so those with no problem gambling, uh, no gambling problems, um, it was very few multi-game players and mostly uh, the lottery players. Uh, low risk players, again, it was mostly the lottery players. And then as we start to get into the more problematic ca categories, so moderate risk, you can see it flips around. Now there's more multi-game players and less uh, low frequency lottery players. And then when we get to the problem gambling uh, players, we can see that it's, it's you know, more than two, two thirds of those players are multi-game players. And it's only a very small percentage of um, low frequency lottery players. So, you know, these um, game frequency and types of games played is related to both uh, positive play, responsible gambling, and levels of problem gambling overall. So uh, knowing all of this then, if we wanted to focus on lower scoring positive players in Massachusetts, uh, who might we focus on? Who might the game sense players uh, want to engage with and in what ways? And so from the data, we're arguing that these particular player segments should be targeted for an increased responsible gambling focus. So first of all, younger players, um, particularly in the, the age range of 21 to 44, because they were scoring much lower on all of the subscales, but in particular in relation to gambling literacy and pre-commitment. And so focusing on these groups with uh, using the media and content that resonate with these players and helping them to understand the benefits of pre-commitment uh, and how games work could be a worthwhile um, avenue to, to pursue uh, and maybe something that game sense players want to, to focus on with their clients. And then the second group 
were the higher frequency multi-game players. So those players who are playing a lot across lots of uh, other types of games, they may play the lottery, but they're playing lots of other games as well. Uh, and although there were no meaningful gender differences in the entire sample, with this group of players, the high frequency multi-game players, they were more likely to be male. And so future responsible gambling efforts might want to focus on high frequency players and again, try to increase their levels of gambling literacy and pre-commitment as they were the lowest levels um, overall. And then finally, I just want to talk very briefly about some ideas for increasing positive play, because now that we know who's scoring what and in what areas, the next real kind of uh, um, frontier, I, I guess, is, is to try to uh, in help those players and increase their positive play scores. I have to say that this is a, um, a fairly new area in the field of responsible gambling. Uh, and so we've been drawing upon the behavioral insights literature to provide some suggestions and a way forward. And one thing is critical that a, a segmented approach is, is the best way to go. And that this one size fits all approach is definitely not optimal. The different players have different needs. But we really need to work with um, stakeholders to, to narrow down ideas and to test ideas for increasing uh, positive play um, before we use them. Um, frequently, what we tend to find is that often in market research companies will be used to develop uh, messaging for responsible gambling. Uh, and whilst they're very good at um, coming up with uh, eye-catching uh, ideas, sometimes those, um, those uh, initiatives don't have the best sort of uh, theory underpinning them. And really what we need to do is set um, goals and strategies so that we can test these ideas before they're sort of rolled out in practice. Uh, and one way that this could be done is to, is to use uh, positive play scores um, before and after these messages are rolled out to see the impact so that we know that what we're doing is actually working. Um, so some other ideas then for increasing gambling literacy. The uh, behavioral insights literature shows us that social proof can be a really good way to persuade people to change their attitudes and behaviors. And so what we mean by that is that when you communicate to people what the majority of other people are doing, it can be very persuasive. People want to, they don't want to stand out too much they want to, to um, conform, I suppose is the word, to what other players are doing. And so communicating a message such as um, gambling is not a good way to try to make money, 82% of players in Massachusetts agree, could be a powerful way to show people that this is what sort of the uh, normal inverted commas behavior looks like, or that your chances of winning don't improve after you lose. You could say the majority of Massachusetts players agree with that. And so this can be a very powerful, persuasive uh, way to get players to change their attitudes and behavior. Um, there are also there's some good evidence to show that um, uh, videos, um, educating people about how games work can be effective. Um, our colleague, Dr. Michael Wall, developed a really good uh, animation about slot machines called What Every Player Needs to Know, which is, has been tested and, and shown to increase players' levels of gambling literacy over time. And what's more, it's, it's a very entertaining um, video and something that players can engage with. So that would be one way to uh, encourage players to be more gambling literate. In terms of uh, pre-commitment then, again, social proof can be very powerful. So as an example here, we could say 94% of players in Massachusetts agree that they should only gamble when they have enough money to cover their bills first. And there are other examples there that could be used. Uh, another technique is called uh, anchoring. And, and this is about communicating um, what, what a sort of average amount is that players bet. And that forms an anchor so that players have a, an idea of where they should start. Uh, and one idea that could be used would be to communicate the average amount that a lotto or scratch ticket winner bets to show that you, know, you don't need to be betting hundreds of dollars in order to win. And so that could be a, another approach. Uh, and then another, another idea for increasing pre-commitment then concerns um, consistency uh, and encouraging players to make a commitment. 
because again, the, the research has shown that um, people in general like to be consistent with what they do and that if they make a commitment to something, they're more likely to follow through with that. So for example, uh, game sense advisors could ask players, you know, how are you going to decide on a limit before they gamble, before you gamble? And this helps them to think about it and then they're more likely to be consistent uh, and carry through with that. And, and it's providing a kind of verbal commitment. Or you could give them some options about these are some ways to, to um, figure out how much you want to spend before you play. And they could tick the boxes and, and that is a kind of commitment. Uh, reducing friction. This is particularly important for um, uh, certainly for online games, but for any game that has um, a player card where you can set limits. You know, it should be easy to use. It should be the default action before playing so that more players will develop it. Uh, and then finally, I think we really need to develop more positive language. And this was really the kind of part of the impetus of the positive play scale. Because we know that the, the term responsible gambling, it has a lot of negative connotations for players. But many players find it patronizing or they think that it's irrelevant for them because they think that it's all about um, people with gambling problems. And so we're really trying to shift the frame to get players to see responsible gambling or positive play, as we term it, as something that all players do. And so we need to think about the more general language around it. So instead of saying things like limit setting or budgets, which don't sound like very much fun at all, we could talk about, say, my money or my bankroll. Uh, and I, I would say that um, we need to try and move away from the term responsible gambling. And I think actually game sense is, is, is a, a step in the right direction towards doing that. Uh, and yeah, that's it. I've come to the end. So thank you very much. I, uh, I hope you found that informative. And if you have any more questions, um, please feel free to ask them now. Great. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Wood. If we could just have the slides taken down now, we'll be able to we see everyone's faces. Great. Thank you so much. Commissioners, do you have questions for Dr. Wood? Com uh, Commissioner Zun oh, sorry. Uh, Commissioner yeah, Zunica, thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Wood. Um, that, was, that was great. Um, I... Um, I want to talk a little bit about that uh, personal responsibility um, part, mm -hmm. which we both um, seem to be doing, you know, best in, in terms of some of the Massachusetts players. And as you said, towards the end, is the one area that is most off-putting uh, because it can be perceived as patronizing or um, et cetera, um, which, you know, I remember well during the game sense uh, uh, when we were Thinking about game sense, that was one of the big findings. Um, the way you talk about uh, responsible gaming is, in many ways, not mentioning the word responsible and other things. But what, in terms of in, in increasing that, or how how are you first measuring it? If you could if you could expand a little bit, and what uh, can be done in that regard, or is that simply an area that is better left to the individual by us focusing on the areas of both opportunity and uh, because we we have them as per your findings, as well as uh, um, you know avoiding the risk of becoming patronizing or perceived as you know lecture. Yeah, so um, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think first of all, it's interesting that. Um, that um, personal responsibility was the, the highest scoring. And I think maybe that speaks to the sort of the successor of past responsible gambling initiatives to some extent in, in that they tended to focus on um, personal responsibility. You know, a common slogan is, is please uh, play responsibly. And, um, you know, that's something that we're, we're, we're actually uh, seeing. And so, I mean, I, I would suggest really um, that that is less of an area that we need to, to focus on because, you know, it's actually doing quite well. Um, most players are scoring high on that. But if we wanted to um, focus in on that particularly, we could look at the individual items on, on the uh, positive play scale 
Uh, and game sense advisors could have discussions, I think, about personal responsibility. So we have items like, um, you know, I should be able to work, I should be able to walk away from gambling at any time. I should be aware of how much money I spend when I gamble. You know, it's my responsibility to spend only money that I can afford to lose. I should only gamble when I have enough money to cover all of my bills first. And I think those areas are things that could be um, discussed. Uh, and we could also use the sort of social proof examples to show that, well, this is actually what a majority of, uh, of players do. So that, you know, I don't, I don't have the figures to hand, but I, I think that it's very high. So, you know, you could communicate that, you know, 95% of players um, only gamble when they have the, enough money to cover all their bills first. And so I think that could be an effective way of doing that and something that um, game sense advisors could look at. But I think in general, I would, um, if you're going to put the resources anywhere, I would focus more on, on the gambling literacy and the pre-commitment. But I suppose if you're a game sense advisor and you're having a discussion and you find that the, the, the player that you're talking to um, has a low level of personal responsibility, then it would be worth having a conversation about those particular areas. And certainly we could provide the figures so that they could communicate back what it is that most players do in relation to those elements. So I think, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I, I think it does. I, um, you know, my follow up a little bit is, is relative to something I guess that you were already at the end. Yeah. which is um, the notion that a couple of these could be joined. Um, you know, one, in, in our experience, and Marlene has, and Mark have, have said, you know, let me say this before, when we rolled out uh, Play My Way at EPC, which is the, the tool about uh, pre-commitment, really, mm -hmm. um, because of the Games and Advisors, um, I think we, we had quite a bit of, uh, of, a, of a great uptake mm -hmm. Um, because they were the ones uh, promoting it. And um, mm -hmm. so in, in, in effect, uh, there was this um, the notion of, you know, the Games and Advisors are there about gambling literacy, but helping us uh, on the, on the pre-commitment um, was in, in retrospective a great, a great outcome. So this combination, as you, as you say at the end, seems to me to be the most uh, promising. Yeah, great, you know, it makes, that makes sense, yeah. Commissioner Cameron. Yep, uh, Dr. Wood, excellent presentation. Thank you. I just had a question about um, Canada. Um, you list Canada, but I, I, how many provinces is it? Is this program um, actually uh, rolled out? You know, are we talking several provinces or um, or not? And and is is it been uh, rolled out long enough to have any measurables? Like what what is mm -hmm. working well? And did that influence your recommendations for what? what to recommend here in Massachusetts. Right, um, so we, we initially developed the, the positive play scale in uh, Canada. First of all, we developed it in British Columbia, uh, and, but then we undertook a project with the, the Canadian Responsible Gambling Association, which represents all of the provincial operators. And we actually used the positive play scale in every province across um, Canada. And that allowed us to validate the scale with a much larger sample and to look at um, you know, other important elements that, that came up in the research. Um, so it's been used widely uh, across Canada. And um, um, oh, what was I going to say? Sorry, I've lost my train of thought now. Um, I was just asking about measurables, if, if it's too oh, soon. Oh, sorry, yeah, that's, yeah measure, yes, yes, I remember now, yes. So, um, so we're actually at the point now where we're starting to run a second study um, in various provinces across Canada to see if there, there's going to be any change over time. So it's going to be interesting to see um, if those scores have shifted. And of course, that will be dependent to some extent on you know, the, the actions that those um, operators have taken. It's going to be a little bit tricky because, of course, this year we've had COVID and, you know, a lot of things have, uh, places have closed down. We did, however, undertake this, um, two studies in New Zealand. So we undertook one in uh, 2018 and then one in 2020. Uh, and we actually did see that um, the scores in general had increased over time. 
Uh, and actually in New Zealand, they'd introduced um, a, uh, a similar system to GameSense um, Play, Play Smart uh, that had been introduced during that period. So whether it's hard to know how much of that had an impact, but certainly they, those scores had shifted over time. And so I think um, it's going to be interesting moving forward to see how uh, scores change. And, and, and I think, as I said before, uh, at some part of my presentation, it's really important to figure out when we're developing initiatives, how well they work before we roll them out and, and to test them. You know, if we're going to develop a message to test it with players before it gets rolled out. And so then we have the kind of the best chance of, of shifting those scores over time. Thank you. Commissioners, other questions for Dr. Wood? Fascinating and, and it shows it's such a dynamic area where we we're 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 noted for for being so ahead and yet it's feeling like we're trying to keep up, right? Teresa, the language is evolving on a regular basis. So um, we really appreciate today's today's presentation. Um, Mark, next steps? Do we? Um, are you all set today? Or yeah, um, Chair, if I could just make uh, two points. Um, Thank you. One is I see this as a, a nice complement in the research agenda that, that's currently underway. So, for example. Um, in the next couple months, you'll hear about the uh, Massachusetts Gaming Impact Cohort, which that study really was designed in order to have a better understanding of, of at-risk and problem gambling in Massachusetts. In fact, um, the sample was drawn specifically to try to recruit as many individuals who are struggling with gambling as possible. And from that study, that, that will... Um, help us and help our public health partners really develop um, strategies and interventions that target that, that specific group, those, or those groups and communities. Whereas the, the positive play study, as Dr. Wood pointed out, really is, it's what, is, what are the characteristics of the, the other, the 98% um, or so of individuals that um, exhibit positive play and this really is intended to help us develop those, those strategies um, that really foster the sort of the protective factors that, that help keep their play in that positive domain. And so I, I like just sort of the complement of the different types of studies that we currently have underway in Massachusetts. And, and thanks to Dr. Wood for, for this specific effort. Um, the other point I just wanted to make is, um, and it really didn't strike me until or until recently is we we really we have a lot of we have the components um, available to us um, and uh, through the game sense program and whether it's our creative ways that we're promoting gambling literacy or the play my way program or relationships that game sense advisors have with patrons that are coming into the casinos all of these are are really essential components. And, um, and we're really, you know, how do we do that better? How do we craft that message so that it's the, take the component that already exists, move it, shift it a little bit so that it becomes more, more effective and in a way that, that is measurable. Um, and so I think that that is, that to me is a, a, um, a really valuable piece of what we'll be able to take, take from this. We're not, we're not going light years ahead in, in introducing entirely new programs. We're talking about incremental changes along the way to, to become the best program we can. That was my takeaway too, Mark. You said in a more eloquent way, but that dynamic nature where it might be tweaking, might become more, but to maintain our leadership position, this is just great input, don't you think? Really well done and very uh, clear for me, Dr. Wood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, if I if if I if I may, um, I see Marlene is um, is in the um, in the in the meeting here um, as as part of our as our vendor on the Game Sense uh, um, 
program, uh, Marlene, if you want to make a comment, um, uh, you know, a lot of what Dr. Wood is identifying as um, things to do, we are, um, we have been thinking about, uh, or we are doing a version of, and we should go further into some of the social proofing and messaging, as well as uh, the game sense um, advisor interactions. Did you want to comment or have a quick uh, uh, question for, uh, for Mr. Wood? Well, I, I just want to thank everyone for the, the support and the time. I think, you know, when we initiated this research with Dr. Richard Wood, um, we were, we weren't really sure what we were going to find out, right? And so one of the things that was helpful, just as has been alluded to here, is that there, we do have the right tools. Um, I think, it, I mean, if I'm excited, the Game Sense Advisors are that much more excited about this data. And the very reason you said, Enrique, I think it, it really helps us to figure out how to solidify um, and anchor some of the messages that we've been using with the right segments. And uh, we've seen this work, um, as Richard uh, alluded to, in other jurisdictions. We also, by the way, have reached out to all the GameSense licensees who have done this um, research in the past and are trying to align some of our efforts to figure out um, what is already working for them, what do we want to apply here. Um, and then we're also um, going to reach out to some of, there are, there are a few jurisdictions that have used the positive play data here in the United States uh, to also find out just kind of what are the differences and, and how can we utilize their experiences here in the US versus Canada. Um, but but I'm really excited about this, as, as Mark said, I think that the moving forward, um, you know, it's not enough to just have, you know, say we're going to focus on older adults or we're going to focus on, um, you know, slot. I think we really are going to be able to uh, further segment and specify uh, the outreach, the uh, gambling literacy in particular. And so the other thing I'll just say about that is that gambling literacy is what we are working on. So it was a little discouraging at first to see that our numbers were as low as they were, um, but it just gives us lots of room for improvement. So, so we're eager. And I would also say that the operators um, can take away, I think sometimes they feel they don't know what to do because uh, GameSense is kind of so powerful and we do so much. Um, but this really gives an opportunity for um, the operators to think about their role in terms of marketing um, uh, responsible gambling or um, some of the messages to, to their segmented um, uh, uh, you know, players and um, on their list. So, so I'm encouraged. I'm, I'm really excited about this. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Marlene. Great. Okay, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, I want I want to pause now. Uh, excellent report, Dr. Wood. Uh, stay well and safe. Thank you. Um, I want to just pause because it is 11:30. We have a good amount of work and consideration ahead. Do we need a, a, a brief break or can we continue on? Uh, Commissioner Zunica is asking for a brief break. It's 11.30 if we could, um, 11.40, is that sufficient? Is that okay? Sure. All right, and then if we need a lunch break, we'll do it a little bit longer, but I'd love to get through the, um, the next couple of items. Thanks, we'll return at 11.40. Thank you, everyone. We can get started again. Um, <clears throat> We're reconvening public meeting 334. Commissioner Cameron? Um, here. Are you taking? No, just a roll call, real quick. Yeah, I am here. Thank you. Commissioner O'Brien? I'm here. And Commissioner Zuniga? Here. Thanks. So we're all set to uh, continue. And, and now we are looking at item number five. General Counsel Grossman, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioners, and everyone. Um, the item before you now pertains to amendments and additions to uh, two sections of the regulations, those found in 134.01 and 02. These amendments have been in effect by emergency since December 3rd, you may recall, and they apply to uh, provisions that will allow the gaming licensees to essentially bring in employees from sister properties on a temporary basis to assist with uh, gaming establishment strategy and or operation. Uh, these provisions are similar to those that found in 134.03 that have been in effect for quite some time um, and were uh, made necessary by the circumstances uh, of the uh, pandemic. And so 
Commissioner Zuniga this morning uh, presided over a public hearing, and with that, uh, the entire promulgation process has been completed, and the provisions are now appropriate for review by the Commission for adoption. Um, and so with that, you have before you the draft amendments, as well as amended small business impact statements, and perhaps I can turn it over to Commissioner Zuniga um, for any comment relative to the public hearing, if, if that would be uh, helpful. Yeah, thank you, Todd. The, the only comment was that, of course, there was no comment. So um, as Todd mentioned, um, this would put us in a position to um, complete the promulgation process. Any questions for Todd on this matter? Uh, Todd, I do understand that you need to um, have action by the commission on this. Commissioner Cameron? Uh, happy to make a motion, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I move that the commission approve the amended small business impact statement included in the commissioner's packet relative to the amendment to section 13401 as discussed. I further move that the commission approve the, um, well, maybe we should take one at a time. Let's start, okay, let, let me stop with the small business impact uh, statement. Do I have a second? I second that motion. Thanks, commissioner. Any questions on that? We'll do the vote on that matter then. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zinnica? Aye. And I vote yes, 4-0. Thanks, Commissioner Cameron? Yep. I further move that the commission approve the amendments to 205 CMR 13401 as outlined in the document of the commissioner's packet as discussed today and authorize staff to take all necessary steps to finalize the associated promulgation process. Great. Do I have a second? Thank you, Commissioner. Any questions on that? We've come full circle here. So Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes, 4-0. Thanks. Can I, can I make a small note? This is very minor, but I just noticed this. The title of 205 CMR 134.01 in the packet has a typo. And it says it reads 1434 uh, as the section. So we I should don't just have that open. That. Um, I don't have that open, Todd. Can we make that uh, correction? So it is a, it is it is just a typo. Uh, I don't I don't think we have a CMR. Yeah, in the packet. Yeah. Uh, the the vote and the reference is correct. It's 134.01. But the, the, Thank the you. packet that I see here for 134.01. Oh yeah. The title, Todd, has 205 CMR 1434. I see that. I'm not sure how that happened, but I will uh, yeah. take a look at that. Yeah, yep. and if, if necessary, uh, circle back to the Secretary of State's office or whatever. That's fine. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Zunica, for picking up on that. All righty, and then we need to move on to the, um, the next item. So just before we do, it looks like the next one has the same typo. I was just about to check that, but yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it must be the yes. title that carried through. I see. I don't have the pack in front of me. Um, I'm <clears> sorry. <throat> That's helpful. Thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to move um, that the commission approve the amended small impact, small business impact statement for regulation 205 CMR 134.02, gaming employee licensees, as presented in the packet. Second. Any questions or edits on that? Okay, then we'll go ahead with the vote. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zinnica? Aye. And I vote yes or zero. Now with respect to the substance. I further move, Madam Chair, that the Commission approve um, the amendments to 205 CMR 134.02, gaming employee licensees, um, as included in the packet, um, with the correction to the title reference, and authorize staff to uh, proceed with the final promulgation process. Second. Thank you. 
Any questions for Todd on and Carrie on that? Okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes. Okay, four zero. Vivian, thank you so much. Okay, we got the thumbs up. That's good. Um, then we can move on to um, item numbers. Oh, Todd, thank you so much and uh, good work. We've completed that that process. Uh, item number six, IEB Director um, Loretta Lilios. Thank you. Hi. Good morning again. Uh, we. Uh, placed this item on the agenda uh, asking you to review the commission's regulations around the use of juvenile records in the background review process. Uh, there's great public interest in the policy side of questions around juvenile records. And you also received a letter from Greater Boston Legal Services a few months ago uh, that you expressed an uh, intention at the time to want to have a public discussion uh, around uh, this issue. Um, so I'll jump right in. Um, I, I wanted to start by uh, reminding that under state law, juvenile court proceedings and by extension juvenile records are treated differently uh, than adult criminal records. Juvenile proceedings are closed to the public Whereas there's a presumption of openness to the public in, in uh, adult criminal proceedings. Even the language that's used around juvenile matters is different. Juveniles that commit offenses are not called juvenile, are, I'm sorry, are not called criminal offenders. They're not said to have been convicted of crimes. They're not said to be guilty uh, of crimes. They're adjudicated delinquent is the language that's used. And so even that language that overlays this area is, it's really intended to avoid the attachment of a criminal stigma uh, to children who are considered by society and, and by law to be highly uh, amenable to rehabilitation. So, so we know that yes, under 23K, there is an explicit policy directive that the paramount policy of the gaming law is to ensure public confidence in the integrity of gaming through the licensing process. That policy directive goes hand in hand with 23K's other explicit policy directive of creating employment opportunities, particularly for the unemployed. So our mission in the IEB is to ensure the credibility of gaming in the Commonwealth and ensure the safety of patrons and the public. But in doing so in the background review process, we are very mindful that we don't wanna be hurting the very people that the Massachusetts gaming law was uh, created to help. Uh, so with, with that said, I wanted to bring your attention to a few provisions of 23K uh, our gaming law. And to be clear, nothing in 23K restricts the IEB's access to uh, reviewing juvenile records in the background review process. 23K does require that the IEB perform background checks on all individuals who are seeking to be licensed or registered as casino employees. 23K accomplishes this by creating different levels of licensure with corresponding levels of background review, depending on the job that the person will be doing. There's a higher level of licensure required under the statute for those who actually participate and work in the conduct of gaming, like handling chips or handling money or have access to restricted areas of casino, positions like a table games dealer, a cashier in the casino's bank, account room employee, a, a, a slot mechanic who has uh, access to the inner workings of a slot machine and security guards who have this higher level of licensure required compared to positions requiring registration such as food and beverage workers who work on the casino floor, porters, environmental service workers who work on the casino floor, and those employees who are not directly related to gaming itself, but are still on the casino floor, uh, require that 
level of certification that the statute calls registration with the commensurate level of background review that corresponds to the exposure and risk posed by the position. So our mandate, the IEB's mandate under 23K of ensuring credibility and integrity, um, uh, we, we want to accomplish the integrity piece in, in the background review process, but in other ways as well, right? You know, our 24 seven uh, presence uh, in the casino by our gaming agents and by the gaming enforcement uh, unit of the state police. But the background review process is a significant way that we do that and it's part of the statutory licensing scheme. So um, in all, instances of licensure and registration the statute directs us to perform a background re review with an eye towards overall reputation and the statute specifies integrity uh, honesty and good character that we look for statute also mandates that we consider patterns of misconduct that um, may make a person unsuitable now over the years the commission has taken a number of steps because you've always been interested in this issue and making sure that people are getting a fair chance at, at these good jobs in the Commonwealth. Back in 2014, when you were first adopting the licensing regulations, you promulgated a regulation that requires us to consider all information in the light most favorable to the applicant. So that's an old overlay that we look at the entire process and always look at our evidence in the light most favorable to the applicant. Also in that first set of regulations, you address to juvenile records explicitly. And you said in the regulations that are in, you know, remain in effect that adjudications of delinquency are not to be treated as automatic disqualifiers under section 16 of the statute. Section 16, as you know, has language that disqualifies individuals with certain prior convictions, uh, felonies, and some uh, convictions that go to truthfulness, like embezzlement, theft, fraud, uh, perjury. Um, but the regulation that you promulgated in 2014 says that there are no automatic disqualifiers for any juvenile matter, and so a juvenile record never renders a person ineligible for licensure or registration. Also in that, it, in the initial licensing regs, you addressed sealed records and stated that sealed records are off limits as part of the background review process. The legislature has given the judiciary the authority to seal both juvenile and adult uh, records and uh, people with the juvenile history or criminal history for that matter, can avail themselves of that process and have their records sealed. They are off limits to the IEB and we uh, take no negative inference from the existence of any sealed record. Last year in 2020, the IEB sought your guidance on a question related to sealed records uh, because in some limited instances, investigators were finding they know the sealed records is off limits, but they were finding some information in public source information like um, media reports uh, that reported on the incident behind a sealed record. So we sought your guidance about, okay, we know we can't consider the sealed record, but what about this other information that does not fall within the statutory definition of sealed records under the sealed records statute? And, uh, you promulgated or you amended the sealed records reg that we have uh, directing that any information related to the sealed record is also off limits. So we take no negative inference uh, uh, from the existence of the sealed record or any information related to it. In 2017, the legislature amended 23K to allow the commission to create exempted job positions at the casinos. Uh, and these exempted positions that have been created are not subject to any IEB background review at all. These positions are entirely exempted from the licensing, registration, and background review process. And 
that uh, amendment was signed into law by the current governor, was fully supported by the commission, may even be fair to say, was spearheaded by the commission. Uh, under that provision, uh, the commission has approved over 300 exempt positions. And for each of those positions, there can be numerous uh, actual employees within each position. Those positions are in areas not directly related to gaming, not on the gaming floor. There are a lot of positions in food and beverage, for instance, including supervisory positions, transportation departments at the properties, positions in hotel administration at the two um, uh, resort casinos, banquet and convention uh, positions, for instance. So the background review process applies to some, but not all of the jobs connected uh, uh, at the casinos. Um, so I, I, I do wanna note that although the uh, juvenile records are accorded a high degree of privacy. We are not alone as an agency as having transparency into them for suitability purposes. Uh, the example that comes to mind is in the firearm licensing scheme, uh, juvenile records, you know, there's full transparency into juvenile records there. And in some of the schemes around a uh, child care uh, workers, evaluation of foster parents and adoptive homes. There's some transparency there. And even in some employment situations, like we're in a licensing situation, not you know, an employer, but even in some employment situations, uh, uh, camps, for instance, have uh, uh, a lens, uh, transparency to juvenile records for uh, camp workers and, and volunteers at camps. So just to reiterate, our statute does not restrict our window into juvenile records. Um, but uh, you, know, you may want to entertain uh, changing our regulations around that area. But I wanna emphasize that when we review an application, we are not, we understand that there's a full person behind that application a person you know with their own trials and tribulations their own struggles their own challenges and um we take our responsibility very seriously we know that there's a policy driver of second chances uh behind this whole scheme and we have exercised our um our licensing uh, decisions in that way we you know we work really hard to be fair uh, and we know that the people behind these applications are just trying to get a job a better job to improve their lives and improve the lives of their families and, and get a good job um, in this industry and that's you know always been front and center in, in our work um, so you know, those are my prepared comments here. You know, I'm happy to uh, try to um, give you any more information that might help you in your uh, in your discussion. Um, but I, you know, turn it over, turn it back to you at this point. Thank, thank you, Loretta. This is really a, a, a great uh, stage that you've set for our discussion. I think today that the the idea would be for us to determine whether we have some kind of a consensus because. The, any formal action would actually be the beginning of a regulatory change if we were going to shift from the status quo. So uh, thoughts, uh, perhaps Commissioner, who would like to start? Commissioner Cameron, hand first, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Loretta, thank you. That was an excellent summary of where we, where we started, where we've evolved to, and uh, the, the issue at hand. Um, and this, the question I have may be for Director Griffin, and that is, um, you know, I know there was a real undertaking um, with sealed records with, with adults. So community groups were very active in, in really educating folks on how to do that. Has there been any similar efforts with uh, juvenile records to educate them so that they understand clearly how to seal a record 
which makes them eligible for um, a job that they may not have otherwise been eligible for. Commissioner Cameron, I'm not aware of any specific efforts around um, juvenile records. I know the community has been um, in community advocacy groups have been uh, working uh, with individuals um, generally surrounding um, sealing their records, but I'm not aware of any um, efforts focused on the juvenile records. My, um, my one concern with removing this tool from the toolbox from our investigators is really with those individuals who may have very recent, very serious, a repeated, a pattern of delinquency. Um, that would be my, my one concern would be that, and, and that very rare circumstance where, again, there's not a time frame, there's not a gap between um, uh, these serious matters and it is repeated. And um, though, though that would be my concern about removing this toolbox since it is, we do have two obligations, right? We do have to make sure it is, we're obligated to investigate and we, we do have to um, make sure we're very concerned about integrity. Um, on the other hand, we're very concerned about opportunities for, for folks too. So that is my one issue with, um, with uh, removing this tool from the toolbox for, from, for our investigators. Commissioner O'Brien or Commissioner Zuniga, who would like to go next? Commissioner um, O'Brien? Build on what Commissioner Cameron just said. Um, part of it is my background in terms of looking at that question of suitability. I, I obviously see it through a lens of um, almost witness credibility, et cetera, and looking at what's allowable. And I, I went back, um, having had the two by two with Commissioner Zuniga and, and once again went back through our statute and to touch a little bit on what Commissioner Cameron is saying there are you know there's a duality of the statute there is an employment basis and then there is a, uh, a regulatory oversight component to it and and right in the beginning 23k11 talks about the fact that the paramount objective of 23k uh, policy objective would be to have public confidence in the integrity of the licensing process and strict oversight and then I went back through the statute and I continued to look at suitability. What does that mean in light of all of the changes that um, Loretta just talked about in terms of the regulations, the 300 plus exempt positions, our discussion less than a year ago in terms of taking what was sort of a technical legal question in that ceiling statute and then reading it broadly to sort of take the intent of that ceiling statute and put it into the process. And my understanding of how we do this right now is it plays into that question of uh, reputation for honesty um, and integrity, which to me, particularly when you look at the sealing statute itself, which you cannot seal a record unless the disposition and or whatever the penalty was, is at least three years old which I think loops into what Commissioner Cameron is saying, which is we have an obligation in the statute and it is the paramount objective. So I would argue slightly more than simply the jobs creation bill to make sure that we are completing what we need to do and that IEB is tasked with the responsibility of assessing someone's suitability. So to me, we have reached what is at this moment, I think an excellent way of handling those records which is we comply with not only the letter but the spirit of the sealing of the juvenile records but we don't do so in a way that's going to hamstring IV's ability to truly assess someone's suitability and i think from what i've been able to gather and going back and looking at the statute looking again at 100b looking at 100c looking at 100f looking at the fact that if you reoffend within that time period it resurrects them. there is a scheme that has been carefully thought out in this area and I think if we are consistent with that, which we are, people can seal, they are barred from sealing in certain circumstances. And I do not see the reason, particularly in our statutory scheme, to change what IEB has access to in making that statutory mandated determination. Thank you, Commissioner Zuniga. And then we can always circle back. Thank you. 
Yeah, no, those are those are um, very good points and eloquent as usual. Um, I'm on the other on the other side of this. Um, I, um, I I know we're we're all trying to strike a balance. Um, I know that um, it's easy to think it's easier to think of the exception or that one instance in which it's, it's egregious, the repeated offender, for example. But if we could put that aside for a minute. Uh, you know, thinking that the repeated offender is likely to also show up in, you know, after being a juvenile. Um, my uh, my take on, on all of this, um, especially in the last year, is everything we were learning about the interactions uh, with the criminal um, justice system um, that tends to be disproportionately uh, falling on, 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 on minorities, on, on communities of color. And when that when that happens, uh, it's uh, I'm not saying that this is what IEB will 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 do, um, because they are very thoughtful uh, about looking at things holistically, like like uh, articulated. But the likelihood of, of of an adverse finding of suitability based on you know these these statistics simply increases, and. Um, and I'll, I'll mention something uh, here that uh, we've, we've, uh, we've also talked about in, in, in another context, in the equity and inclusion group. One of the recommendations was to do a regulatory review towards an eye on regulations that may have an impact, a disproportionate impact on, uh, on the people that we deal with, specifically communities of color. Um, I would argue that this would be an element of that uh, review, that if we were reviewing that uh, um, uh, with, with, with that lens, we would be having this conversation just like we're having now. Um, is it likely that when licensing and looking at the, the, for suitability, uh, all of which is in the statute, I, have, I, I, I acknowledge that all of that. Um, are, we, are we likely going to have a, 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 a more adverse effect on, on certain communities? The other, the other piece, and, 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 my, and my instinct, I don't have you know hard data on this. I just have a lot of what's reported in you know um, in, in in the recent history is that um, statistically, you know, communities of color have a greater chance of having had bad and uh, uh, interactions with with the system, as well as uh, bad outcomes, if you will. Um, the other piece um, I think is is something that Loretta mentioned um, early early on in her remarks. And that is the notion of, um, you know, that as, as a whole, um, the, 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 the system treats uh, juvenile records um, in a more benign way. Society treats them in a more, in a more benign way um, compared to the criminal uh, system for adults, of course. And, and um, in that spirit, um, I think um, we, we should uh, do the same. When we, when we bring in, um, all of the records for consideration um, that, that pertain to the juvenile uh, uh, records, um, I think we are, we are leaning on the side of less leniency in my, in my opinion. Now, again, it's easy to think of the one or two exceptions, you know, somebody who's gonna be a repeat offended and offender, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm thinking of averages and likelihood. And um, that's my, that's my take. So I'll chime in right now and then we can circle back. Um, first off, I want to thank IEB and, and General Counsel Grossman for looking at this, this matter. Um, we've spent some good time thinking about it and it was um, a matter that I, I asked them to look at after our discussion on the sealed record because um, Ms. Carrion had raised in her, her thoughtful letter from the Greater Boston Legal Services Office you know, concerns and, and wanting to really raise awareness around um, juvenile records. So I'm pleased that we had the input from the community and, um, and, and experts in the area. And I also really appreciate the thoughtfulness that our own team has put into this, this matter. Um, I want to note again that right now under the legislative scheme, we do have considerable discretion in our regulatory function, and we are aware of that. And with that comes a great deal of responsibility. Um, 
there is no prohibition on the review of juvenile records in the statute. We also have considered um, that we've, we've gone back and, and, and Loretta has outlined all the steps that the commission has taken over the history to think about the issues that come with the responsibility of ongoing suitability. The, um, when we think about juvenile records, we are all aware about, of the increased responsibility we have to the science associated with juvenile development and with a societal impact on, on um, their records as just as Loretta raised. Um, I am also uh, appreciating Commissioner Zuniga's point that we have made an internal commitment to making sure that our practices, our regulations don't in some way have a disproportionate um, effect on people of color. With that said, it's my understanding right now that we have not disqualified. Am I right, Loretta, over the course of your review of, of um, licenses of any, any juvenile at this point? Is that That's correct? right. That was part of your initial uh, regulation promulgation back in 2014. You, you made the affirmative determination that uh, no juveniles, regardless of the record, would be uh, disqualified or rendered ineligible uh, by virtue of the existence of a, of a record. Would but be there is a possibility, excuse me, excuse me, Commissioner, um, but there is a possibility that that they would not be able to be hired given the review of a pattern. Is that correct, Loretta? That, that's correct, that the, uh, 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 the existence of a record could still be considered as part of the overall suitability determination. And at this point, have we had any um, individual be denied a position based on that pattern? You know, our denial rate overall is pretty low and we have not had any rejection rate based solely on the existence of a juvenile record. Okay, so I think that's just really helpful background to, to know. Um, I am very much thinking that um, I have, I'd have a couple of recommendations that uh, for the IEB to think about and, and for us to consider as a commission. The legislature hasn't taken that tool out of the toolbox and Commissioner Cameron's quite right. And it's, it, and, and Commissioner Zuniga says, yes, there, there's always a potential for a couple of the, the outlier situations where that 17 year old has made a very significant um, poor choice that could, um, come up through the juvenile record and at 18, now remember that individual would not be precluded from being hired at certain entry level positions, but where there are more risks attached to the integrity of the game, which is a paramount obligation of our mission, where there is of course our, our paramount um, obligation to protect safety of patrons and employees, including our own who work at the game, those jobs do have a higher level of scrutiny. And if we were to take away through a reg that the legislature hasn't taken out of our toolbox, that ability to review those juvenile records for that, those particular jobs, we might, even though it would be very low risk, challenging our, our core mission, which is to protect, as I said, the, the integrity in the, of the games and the safety of the individuals there. I'm wondering, I also want, I think we've all heard, and I think I know I have personal confidence in the IEB's um, long history under, under Karen Wells' earlier direction, and now under Loretta's current direction, and, and into the future of unknown IEB director in the future, that we understand we must strike that balance, and we've used that words today, of our obligation to, um, to, 
to rec recognize we have huge, broad discretion, but that we also have other duties of fairness around the issues that Loretta outlined, juveniles, the, the second chance theory, the idea of individuals being able to get these jobs. I'm wondering if it would be helpful that outside a formal regulatory process, if Loretta and team could memorialize that that's their approach to the balance and the factors that get considered. And then we leave our tool chest in the status quo. I also know that one of the concerns that has been raised since I've been at the commission is if an individual is denied, because the first round Loretta goes through the IEB um, process. And then if an individual doesn't have the opportunity to be hired because of a uh, background review, they would have an appeal right to the commission as a whole. Am I, is that a fair characterization of the process already? Do you want to? I do, and I'm glad you brought that up because I did want to put a finer point on this notion of discretion. And, and I know you're aware of this, but just so there's no misapprehension in, in the public, uh, because, you know, really the IEB does not have broad or subjective discretion in this arena. Every decision that we make on suitability one way or the other must be directly tied to uh, statutory and regulatory criteria. The, in getting to your question about the review process, uh, Kathy, the, if there's an aggrieved person, you know, somebody that's denied, that person has a right to review by an impartial hearing officer. And as part of that review and part of that hearing process, the person has the right to all of the materials that the IEB has considered in its decision. The person has a right to tell their own story, to bring in witnesses, to examine the IEB's witnesses, uh, and these hearing officers that you have retained are experienced in the administrative review and hearing process, including for individuals who are not represented by counsel and making sure that those individuals you know, have a fair opportunity. The technical rules of evidence, for example, do not apply in those hearings. So those people are not uh, you know, prohibited by complicated rules that, uh, you know, technical rules that they may not understand. And those impartial, unbiased hearing officers who are not part of the IEB, um, I can tell you from personal experience that, you know, put the IEB, uh, take the IEB to task for uh, for any decision. So I did want to correct any misperception by the public that there's, you know, a broad or subjective mm -hmm. discretion uh, right. by the IEB. But getting to yeah, your I, question about the hearing, there is the, that hearing right for by impartial hearing officer and then review is available to the full commission, um, um, you know, following that process. Right, and thank you for clarifying. The discretion that's broad is with us in terms of our regulatory scheme. My point yes. is that right now the statute does contain that tool for yes. juvenile records. And theoretically, we may have discretion to limit it on balance, given all the considerations and all of the, as Commissioner O'Brien points out, all of the regulatory scheme that supports your review plus the sensibilities that you've outlined that I'm wondering if we would want maybe in, a, in some kind of a policy to memorialize that safeguarded with our appellate process, which I know too can, could perhaps be explained you know, in, 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 in a way that folks might avail themselves of that appellate process if they do have a adverse decision and recognize that they may not even need a lawyer, that it's accessible, and we would work to make sure that it is. So I'm thinking that there's some room to perhaps memorialize the sensibilities of the process, the review of our, and, and, and our ongoing suitability responsibilities at these, not the, not the entry level positions, remember. The, a, a juvenile with a record that 
that those records are never looked at for the entry level positions. And they're extensive positions and that's great work by the legislature and the governor. And then perhaps we also think about making sure that for all people they understand their right for an appeal and how we can actually make that a very accessible process. And to Commissioner Zuniga's point, make sure that that process isn't somehow um, either perceived or actually in reality have an, um, an inadvertent effect on people of color, communities of color. Uh, because it could, it could seem like it's more burdensome than really we would want it to be. So that was my thought um, in terms of maybe not a regulatory change, but some internal practices that could be memorialized. Anyway, enough for me. Commissioner Cameron, Commissioner O'Brien, who wants to go next? Uh, I, I agree with all of that. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I have been uh, Captain Connors will advise you that uh, I have been sensitive to these issues from day one, um, making sure people are treated with respect and that we do a very thorough but very fair investigation and we do err on the side of getting people employed, giving folks an opportunity. And I, I can say that over the years I've been, um, I've tested the system, I've looked at it closely and I, I, I have really, um, I have really been pleased with the manner in which we interview, the, um, uh, the way that we do err on the side of getting people to work and the understanding that that's a big part of our mission. So um, I, I agree with what you just said, Chair. Commissioner O'Brien, thank you, Commissioner Cameron. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I would reiterate what you said, which is when you look at how this statutory and regulatory scheme has been implemented from its inception. Um, I, I don't see any reason to question the manner in which it's been executed. Uh, there is also the appellate process that's an avenue for relief if someone does feel like they have been wronged. Um, but I do think that the regulatory scheme that we have right now complies with the statutory mandate. It strikes the balance. Um, I think continuing always to have conversations about disproportionate impact on any sort of community is, is that will be perpetual. I don't think we're ever going to not have that conversation. Um, so sort of memorializing it, um, it to me is fine. It makes perfect sense. Commissioner Sunika. You, you know, to, to that end, um, I, um, I, I was thinking and talking to Loretta, uh, um, you know, a little bit before uh, today about the information in the forms that we've approved in the past that tend to be, uh, you know, mostly about all the, the history, all the records, you know, in juvenile, or, you know, in this case, or a criminal, et cetera. Um, and we don't have a lot of space where I think we could, you know, do well by including elements like a personal statement or uh, a, a way for applicants to explain facts and circumstances around a particular record, um, you know, that could actually, or involvement in other, uh, uh, you know, other um, activities that we would deem worthy, I don't know, community organizations, volunteering, uh, church, etc., cetera, um, that can actually go to mitigate, if you will, or, 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 or paint a, a fuller picture of, of an individual with an actual uh, record or set of records um, in which then, you know, in the desk review that, that IV does, all that additional potentially beneficial information um, could be also considered. I know there's references uh, that mostly are followed up on for the highest uh, levels of licensure, which is, I think, very appropriate. Um, but as you speak about what we could do in terms of policy or out of uh, the regulatory scheme, um, uh, my, it occurs to me that the form, taking back, taking, and, and, and we've looked at this and it's extensive and it's not right away, but we could come up with, you know, a, 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 a system to enhance the ability of somebody to explain the, their facts and circumstances. One day it's not onerous. Uh, the, the facts and circumstances around a particular record or other elements about their life 
that could be viewed as a mitigating slash rehabilitating um, element to, to their past. So what I hear you saying, Commissioner Zuniga, and this has been the topic of the working group on equity and inclusion, is that, uh, that when investigations, uh, Director Lilios, are conducted in the tools that, that your team uses to conduct investigations, um, could they be enhanced in any way to ensure that somehow um, uh, the, the stories of the individuals applying are, are clear and are full, and that somehow they don't disproportionately affect um, people of color um, or communities of color for whatever reason, including our all of us, we have those implicit biases. That is an exercise I think that we are contemplating Director Wells for um, overall uh, reg review and practices review. That doesn't necessarily, um, that's not necessarily directed at the issue today, which really are the re inclusion of juvenile records in that re review. But I do think it's probably not, I, I imagine all of us are agreeing commissioners that that's always a fair, fair review that we should be doing. Commissioner Cameron, I see nodding head, Commissioner O'Brien, and, uh, and Director Griffin, I think that you know, you're, she's nodding her head too. And, and I know Director Lilios, we've already had some preliminary discussions on that work that will be comprehensive going forward. Uh, but today's focus, and again, not a formal vote, would be simply put, based on the totality of our discussions today and considerations, do we remove from the IEB's consideration in their ongoing suitability responsibilities um, review of juvenile records? And I, I'm seeing no from Commissioner O'Brien, not at this juncture, to do so through a regulatory commissioner, Cameron. And Commissioner O'Brien, uh, Zuniga, I'm sorry, would you say that you would want them removed? I, I, I would, and I understand, I understand very well the arguments against, against yeah. that, um, yeah. but I, I hope you do the same for my... my and so, and, and I, I um, do support maintaining the status quo, uh, again, with ongoing vigilance around uh, the, the thoughtful practices that I have confidence are in place today. Um, and to assure, you know, that we sort of understand that's always healthy, I think, to memorialize them. So perhaps that's an exercise that we can, we can proceed on and reflect upon. And that actually might, um, might put Commissioner Zunica in a, in a different thinking. But at this time, I, I don't think we have a consensus to, to vote into a, a, the commencement of a regulatory change. If that, that's okay. correct. Okay. But, um, you know, I think this is a really important discussion and one that I have to say for myself that I've been really thinking about um, for a while, but certainly um, knowing that today I would have to make some kind of a decision on this, really reflecting on, as I said, all of the totality of our responsibilities and I um, have considered carefully what the legislature intended as Commissioner O'Brien so carefully um, outlined today for us. So thank you. Director Lilios, is that helpful? Uh, very much. I you know, appreciate uh, the very thoughtful conversation uh, around this. You know, I understand the uh, directive on memorializing as a uh, policy matter around consideration of these issues and you know we'll uh, we'll get going on on that and just appreciate your uh, attention and just the careful consideration that you uh, give and your guidance and uh, leadership on you know, these really important questions thank you and again thank you to um, Pauline carry on for the um, input we um, it did, it did launch us to really think about this with careful consideration, so thank you. And, and uh, Director Griffin, I know that you, you are in touch with members of the community. And so again, we, we welcome their, their input on an ongoing basis, so thank you. 
All right, and you know what? That conversation was just long enough that my computer went to sleep. So, what do I have? Um, I have a backup plan, Karen. Um, and I've got it in front of me. The next one is the independent director's uh, gaming vendor primary status update. Thank you so much with Kate. Um, yes. Loretta, do you want to frame it or is Kate going to launch right in? No, I'll that? let her jump right in. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Good, good morning. Um, I, do I see her? Oh, there she is. Good morning, Kate. Hi there. How are you? Well, oh, thank you. I'm glad to hear it. And um, hello, uh, other commissioners. Nice um, to see I'm you here. as always. Yes. Lovely, lovely to see everybody on the meeting. Um, I'm here today to report on a project um, about review of the chair people of audit and compliance committees for our vendors. Um, this was a project undertaken as part of some periodic review that's been done by the IEB surrounding our qualification practices and our scoping practices when we are undertaking suitability investigations for our vendors. Um, specifically, we wanted to determine whether or not changes should be made to the current practice of examining the chairs of uh, the audit and compliance committees of our vendors on a case-by-case -case basis during the course of our suitability investigations for vendors or um, as an alternative whether they should be made more of a compulsory part of that process um, and the regulation governing this particular uh, qualification process is 205 CMR 13404 um, and specifically the sections relevant to this discussion on gaming vendor qualifiers are at subpart D and E um, and those discuss the discretionary authority of the IEB and the licensing division in determining who should be an individual qualifier for a gaming vendor. Um, and that's across uh, gaming vendor primaries and secondaries. Um, without going into the specific language there, and I'm happy to if it's uh, instructive to the commissioners or if you'd rather just pull it up as I read along. Um, this as review, as I mentioned, is not the first review surrounding um, this particular provision of the regulations. Um, originally, uh, at the inception of the agency, we were capturing all directors regardless of their status. Uh, we then revised the procedure surrounding um, uh, outside directors or independent directors, and these are directors who would have a stake um, in the uh, company and ownership share in the company that's serving as the vendor uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, and we then examined uh, more specifically after that, uh, the chairs of the board of directors of our vendors um, and their status as either inside or outside directors and how that factored into our scoping and, and uh, qualification procedures uh, for those particular positions at our vendors. So um, a further iteration of that inquiry uh, was whether or not the chairs of the audit and compliance committee should become more of an automatic part of our scoping uh, due to the fact that audit and compliance are particularly relevant issues when evaluating suitability of a vendor. Um, we currently do examine these positions on a case-by-case -case basis and specifically we examine also some documents in conjunction with the function of these committees which we find particularly helpful and these include committee charters and the minutes of compliance and audit meetings that are conducted by our vendors at, pursuant to their corporate governance. Um, these are very helpful in evaluating how efficiently uh, these particular committees are functioning and whether they're serving the purpose that is set out uh, in the bylaws of the vendors. Um, that's particularly important in evaluating suitability. And another piece of this inquiry was whether or not um, subjecting the chair people of those particular committees would help us to evaluate uh, you know, the efficacy of those particular committees. Um, to dig down into the details of how we uh, furthered this inquiry, we asked our vendors for some information. Uh, and what we needed to evaluate was how subjected those people to individual qualification would interact with the timing of a suitability investigation. And that is largely due to the fact that these positions rotate. Um, so someone may step into a role and then rotate out of it. Um, and was that uh, a set period, like a term limit? Was it mandated by uh, either local or sometimes national regulation, as in the case of Australia? Um, or is it something that was just at the discretion of the rest of the board of directors? Um, could we complete an investigation into an individual in one of these positions um, in enough time before they rotated out of the position to sync up with the larger investigation on suitability of the vendor at which they were serving in that position? Um, that end, uh, we surveyed a landscape of 24 vendors and we essentially had uh, 24 very different answers, uh, leading us to believe that uh, perhaps remaining uh, in a posture of evaluating these on a case-by-case -case basis was 
most practical. Um, and in addition, we wanted to know how other jurisdictions handled um, this, this specific interplay between the timing of an investigation um, and their regulatory authority, along with um, the variance and corporate practices at this level. Um, reached out to uh, other regulators in Nevada, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Maryland, and we found that they also have a similar discretionary authority conferred by their regs and that they do rely upon it to evaluate these particular positions. Uh, essentially, if they feel that this person, the chair of auditor compliance, has uh, a direct hand or influence on the operation um, or business that the vendor is doing in the jurisdiction, they may be captured, but it's not a compulsory part of the processes in those jurisdictions either. Um, so, based on the information we received from our vendors, um, and we're quite thankful for uh, their willingness to provide that and the cooperation we received from other jurisdictions, uh, we do believe that our current practice of evaluating uh, these roles on a case-by-case -case basis for qualification uh, is the best way to ensure a thorough suitability investigation at the vendor level. Uh, and I do want to thank uh, my comp uh, co counterparts in the licensing division for their help and also um, our paralegal in IEB, Erica Willie. She was crucial in helping me complete this project. Uh, it was definitely a team effort. With that, any questions uh, from commissioners, I'd welcome and hopefully uh, I can help you answer them. Commissioners, Commissioner O'Brien, do you have uh, questions or comments for Kate? Um, no, you don't have to go into a lot of detail, but when you say you surveyed 24 vendors and got basically 24 different answers, um, sure. What do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> so, so we asked vendors uh, whether or not their chairs of auditor compliance were either um, inside directors, or outside directors. There was no real consensus there. Some of them were inside, some were outside. In one case, someone was an independent contractor. Um, we asked whether or not they were subject to mandatory rotation um, in or out you know, at the particular authority of anyone. That varied quite widely. Some were appointed at the discretion of the board. Uh, some uh, had to be reelected annually. Some served for a term of okay. years. So quite a, quite a wide variance there. Um, and as I say, some were regulated purely by kind of their corporate bylaws and sometimes a local or a national level regulation mandated um, a term limit. Uh, in some of oh. them. All right, that's helpful. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Cameron? Yeah, I had a quick question as well. You mentioned, um, Kate, that, um, you know, because they have different roles and responsibilities or that that would determine if, in fact, you take a closer look if it warranted uh, conducting this um, investigation. Is that the only factor involved is is there control um, in in the company, or are there any other factors that would um, cause you to take a take a closer look? Sure, we would want to evaluate um, first of all what you know what is what is the vendor doing in in our jurisdiction uh, in general, and then evaluate um, how the reporting structure functions uh, with regard to that person. Because although they may not have you know perhaps an ownership stake in the company. They may be crucial in a reporting structure that um, really is the underpinning of, of an effective compliance or audit committee. Um, so that's something we would look at. I, I found it to be a very individualized um, inquiry depending on the size um, of the vendor, uh, the purpose of the vendor, and also where they're located, whether internationally or nationally. Um, so there are several different lines of inquiry we would take. Uh, and again, we find review of the documentary um, uh, you know, kind of the documents associated with these committees to be very helpful as well in making sure that we're consistent across our vendors. Okay, thank you. Commissioner um, Zunica, you, you shifted on my, my chart. There you are. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> you no, know, um, ju just to say, uh, Kate, that's a very good summary. I'm, I'm um, I'm very uh, comfortable with the approach that uh, that you've taken, and 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 I want to commend you for the research that you and the team have done towards this topic. Uh, I think leaving your approach as you outlined it is, is is appropriate. We've had, you know, early discussions. I remember about taking a risk-based approach on a number of of, of issues, and, I, and and it occurs to me that because of all the Complicating factors that you outline relative to how some of these committees are structured, et cetera, and that it's best to take the approach that, that you have. So thank you for all that great summary and um, 
good work. Thank you for the feedback. I'm all set. Thank you. Um, I also had the benefit of a very thorough um, review and uh, ahead, Kate. Um, thank you, and thank you to thank you for acknowledging that it was a team effort, and thank you to that team. Thank you very much, Director Lilios. Are we all set then uh, with respect to your items for consideration today? We are. Thank you. <laughs> all set. Okay, thanks, very thorough work. Moving on now uh, to item number seven. I see Dr. Lightbound has joined us. Good, good afternoon, Dr. Lightbound. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, our items today uh, deal with the unclaimed tickets. Um, as you know, by statute, patrons have a calendar year after the year they have placed a pair of mutual uh, bet uh, to cash it. Uh, so this year, the Tickets that were purchased in 2019 are coming up. Um, by statute again, the uh, tracks have 90 days from the end of 2020 to send these tickets to the Gaming Commission, um, payable to the Commonwealth. Um, our senior financial officer, Chad Bort, has met with the different tracks and um, has reviewed their unclaimed tickets and uh, come up with the amounts that are due. Um, for Plain Ridge, it's one hundred and seventy-three thousand five hundred and seven and seventeen cents. Uh, for Suffolk, it's two hundred and sixty-three thousand seven hundred and thirty-one and forty-one cents. Uh, Wonderland is three thousand eight hundred and thirteen, uh, twelve cents. And then for Raynham, it's one hundred and forty thousand and nine dollars and ninety-five cents. Um, we can uh, go through these on the agenda there listed as items A through D for separate votes, or in the packet we have a motion that um, puts them all together. So it's up to the commission how they would like to um, proceed. Uh, my recommendation is that we approve the payment of these funds to the Gaming Commission. General Counsel Grossman, is there any reason that we can't make it one motion or would you prefer that they be all separated? I, I think they can be done together. I think the record is clear as to what the figures are that you're discussing. They're all outlined clearly in the packet, but it's uh, just a matter of preference. And does it combine the um, the new authorization for for um, CFA of um, Lennon? Do we need to separate that out? I think yes, you should separate, separate that, out. yes. Okay. Thanks. So it's the, the figures first that you want Thank to approve you. and then the authorization to redistribute them. Yeah, so this is to have it come in to the Gaming Commission. A through D. Do I have a motion? Or any discussion, maybe I should say that. Are there any questions for um, Alex? And I see Chad has joined us. I see no very no questions. Yes, I was just going to say that this is something we've done over the years and uh, without any any issues whatsoever. The work is always well done, well prepared. So um, uh, if you'd like, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to make a motion. Thank you very much. Uh, I move that the commission approve the unclaimed winnings for figures presented in uh, Dr. Lightbaum's memorandum including included in the commissioner's packet so that the respective licensees may deposit those funds with the commission. Second. Any clarifying language needed? All right. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes. So that's 4 0. Now to create further efficiencies, Dr. Lightbound. So um, item F talks about how we distribute the unclaimed tickets. Again, this is all by statute. Um, procedurally, uh, once the monies come back from the tracks, then our financial division send these monies back out to the track once they've cleared. And um, then they get distributed to different funds uh, for the uh, Horse racing tracks, they go into a purse account. And for the Greyhound tracks, they go into the um, racing stabilization fund. Uh, so usually we wait until um, these funds have come in, uh, usually around April. 
and then we bring it all back again to the commission for um, their approval. Um, so um, we thought uh, trying to do things a little more efficiently that um, procedurally, we would ask that um, once these funds have been submitted by the licensees and cleared by the um, MGC bank account, um, that the finance department will be able to um, distribute these funds back to the licensees if the commission um, so feels that this will be appropriate. And then they'll be accredited, uh, accredited to the appropriate funds. Any I discussion? Think it's, Go no, ahead, I do think Cameron. it's appropriate that we move in this manner. Um, and that it is an efficiency. Okay, and I see Commissioner Zuniga, who is our, yeah, our advocate for streamlining and efficiencies and cost savings. So that all makes good sense. Then do so, I have a motion? Yep, Madam Chair, I further move that the Commission authorize the Commission's Finance Office to distribute those funds upon deposit to the uh, respective purse accounts of the licensee that generate the unclaimed funds. Second. Second. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. And I vote yes, four zero. Great work, Dr. Lightbound and Chad. Thank you for joining today. Um, thank you. I, if we're all if set. I could also um, thank Chad um, and Todd and Derek for their help on this issue. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, I know that uh, Derek isn't isn't here today, but General Counsel uh, Grossman, thank you. Okay, Commissioner, updates. Anything that anyone wants to bring to the attention of the team today or the public? Okay, and no other business. But we do have. Um, um, an executive session that we're anticipating that requires, of course, a, a, a vote on, on the part of the commission. We um, understand that uh, from our general counsel that it would be helpful and we anticipate meeting in an executive session to review, um, to review minutes <clears throat> from previous executive sessions convened in accordance with GL Chapter 30A in order for the commission to discuss strategy. I'm really wondering about this. You can see I'm struggling with it as I read it. Uh, first up, we are going to convene for the purposes of discussing the matter as well as for review of minutes. Is that fair, uh, General Counsel Grossman? Or is it simply to review minutes? I think it's really just to review the minutes um, at this point. Okay, the That's commission. As well. yeah. Okay, so I just want to make sure. Commission anticipates that it will meet an executive session to review minutes from previous executive sessions convened in accordance with GL Chapter 30A in order for the commission to discuss strategy with respect to litigation where such discussion at an open meeting may have had a detrimental effect on the commission's litigating position. Uh, for the public, the public session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of the executive session. So um, at this point, we don't adjourn the public meeting formally. We will do that in the executive session if we vote to so move. Are there any questions for General Counsel Grossman as we, as I take a roll call vote on this matter? Just to clarify, so it's appropriate for us to go into executive session to deliberate review and potentially edit the minutes, is that correct? I believe that's wholly appropriate. There's no other way to discuss minutes. Um, I mean, as would, the only item, I meant as the only agenda. As the only item, absolutely. I think okay. it would defeat the purpose of holding an executive session in the first place okay. if a public body you know, were required to review the minutes in public. So that's, we're just going in solely to look at minutes of but there is a strategic component to that. Right. That's right. what I think is important, a strategic component with review of the minutes. And that's yeah. why we need to go into executive session. Is that correct, Commissioner O'Brien? I'm sorry. No, that's that's the clarification that I was just looking for. Yep. Is that fair, uh, General Counsel Grossman? That's right. I mean, there is absolutely. 
that was the whole purpose behind the executive session in the first place. Yeah. And now you're looking at the minutes of that discussion. Okay, excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I do need to take a vote based on uh, General Counsel Grossman's advice. Well, I'll make the motion, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, the commission go into executive session for the purposes that you discussed uh, and outlined uh, earlier. Second. Thank you. All right, we'll take a roll call vote for the record. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes, four, zero. Vivian, thank you so much for your assistance today. Um, I'm sure you got it all. <laughs> it was a lengthy <laughs> meeting. So we appreciate your um, taking on this uh, responsibility today. And um, again, as I noted, we don't have a formal adjournment. Executive Director Wells, are we all set to shift to, um, I guess we need to talk about timing, um, yeah. uh, shift to our other me our meeting room? Yes, exactly. My understanding is we have that scheduled for two o'clock so that the team can take a break for lunch and then we convene right at two. Is that correct? Do you think that we could move it up or do we need it's Am I right that it's 10 of? It's, what time it's, is it right now? It's 12.53 right now. 1.30 if that works and we could grab lunch and then go into this. I would welcome moving it up. Is there is there anyone who would be hindered by moving it up? No. no. Does anybody no. benefit by moving it up? Yes. Fine. Good. Okay, All right. So then, as long as um, as long as the team that's necessary for um, assistance on this matter is available, we'll we'll, re we'll reconvene at the um, in the executive session meeting room, which is of course virtual, um, for one thirty. Uh, Karen, I don't know if that means we need to have an adjustment to the invitation. My understanding, it, it, when I've done it before, you can just click on it and you can click on it early and get in. You just have to be the first one in, but I can confirm with um, IT and if, if there's something different, I'll send everyone an email. You'll send a new invite or something for 1.30. Excellent. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for the great work today to the entire team. Really interesting meeting. As always, we're very fortunate that we have such a wide range of really interesting, compelling topics to discuss. And, and, and with that comes a wide ranging responsibility. So thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. One thing.